Okay, well, we are taking our testimony on the first. Senate 53. Yes, would you like to go first? Yes. Okay. For the record, uh, Dr. Deb Richter. Does this mean I have to I have to go through this, right? Is that I will set that up. Okay. Uh, Deborah Richter, I'm a family physician practicing family medicine and addiction medicine in Vermont. I'm also chair of Vermont Healthcare for All, and I'm here on behalf of Vermont Healthcare for All. Um, and I'd like to start off by uh, reminding the committee uh, that Senate Health and Welfare, the policy committee, spent two years drafting the bill that would start us down the path of eventually providing publicly funded primary care to all Vermonters. In that time, the Senate Health and Welfare Committee took testimony from hundreds of witnesses. It had initially 13 co-sponsors and three other confirmed votes if it got to the floor. Senate Finance passed it without comment, and unfortunately, the majority of the Senate Appropriations Committee did not agree with the policy of public financing of health care, and Senator Tim Ash created the strike all amendment you see before you in the revised version of S-53. So the advocates are actually very confused about the purpose of the policy committee and the purpose of the money committees. We're confused. Um, but we'd like to say that this revised in version. The, in the Senate. Pardon? In the Senate. Yeah, yes, in the oh, Senate. And so I'm, yes, thank you very much. The yes, in the, in the Senate. We're very confused. So I we don't know who can conference. clear this have, up for us. It won't be us. Okay. It will not be us who are going to clarify what the Thank Senate you. committee is to do and don't do. This what revised version um, of S-53 is passed by Senate. <clears throat> the Senate is nothing more than a study which will be shelved and will not lead us to meaningful reform. Vermont Health Care for All would like the original language restored. And why? Because there are three main reasons. First of all, primary care is the most valuable sector in health care. Secondly, cost sharing impedes access. Third, importance of public funding of primary care is the only way to make it universal. <coughs> and all of three of love were essentially eliminated in the revised version of S-53. <clears throat> so primary care being the most valuable sector, I, the value of that is indisputable. Um, in a nutshell, studies show that when primary care is available to a population, the outcomes are better, the health of the population is improved, system costs are lower, and quality of care is improved. Much of this is due to patients accessing care earlier in their disease, patients having continuity of care with a provider who specializes in them, and whom they have an established ongoing relationship with, and I have references that have been put on the um, website. It should be noted that primary care, uh, while having great value, has a very reasonable price tag. While we will be spending $2.5 billion on hospitals this year, this uh, more than $6 billion in total in health care, Primary care is actually less than 6% of the total, and that's including mental health and substance abuse services. So we're getting, really, in a sense, you can get great value for the money. Um, the second point I want to make is, and again, some of these points will be elaborated by other witnesses, but the cost sharing, uh, and that was in the form of if having no insurance, you're sharing all the costs, um, if you have high co-pays and deductibles. But, Recognizing the value of primary care, Vermont Health Care for All endorses elimination of cost sharing for primary care. Why? The original version sought to remove financial barriers to care by eliminating cost sharing for primary care, meaning no deductibles, co-pays, or direct payments. We feel the evidence shows they impede access to primary care. I'd like to mention that Dr. Elliot Fisher, I'm sure all of you are aware of who he is. He's the director of the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and is the father of the ACO and all-payer movement nationally, he has a similar concern in an exchange published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Commenting on the rise of cost sharing and deductibles, he stated, I quote, as systems invest anew in primary care and care coordination, patients have a new incentive to avoid their doctors. Substantial or poorly targeted cost sharing could easily undermine these approaches. Numerous studies have shown that cost sharing is a blunt instrument causing patients to cut back on both needed and wasteful care. ACO, the all-payer movement in Vermont, does not eliminate cost sharing. I don't know if everyone is aware of that. I think they think we're paying doctors differently, but the patient comes to the ACO with significant cost sharing still in place. So they still have an incentive to avoid care. So if someone's uninsured prior to going to the ACO, they may enter care with diseases that were entirely preventable had they sought care earlier. 
Now, there's a RAND study frequently quoted. It was done in 1970. It did conclude that when people are subjected to cost sharing, they use less care. It's true. It concluded that people use less unnecessary care, but they also use less necessary care. And the same is probably true today. We must ask ourselves, is this what we want when it comes to primary care? Do we want people to avoid primary care? Most of it is in the form of prevention, of primary disease, secondary complications when someone already has a disease. And let's face it, the biggest experiment in cost sharing is with the uninsured, who we know are two to three times more likely to die of the same disease as their insured counterparts. And I would say that primary care is where patients go to to determine what is necessary and unnecessary. We don't want to see them avoiding this care. My third point is the importance of the public funding of primary care, uh, which again was put into question in the, in the version you have before you of S53. But what is, why do we need to publicly fund primary care and all health care eventually? It's the only thing that allows continuous coverage and prevents churning. What we see now is people, especially seasonal workers, they're on Medicaid, they're off Medicaid. I see them all the time. They come in when they have insurance, then they don't come in when they don't. It allows continuity of care. Um, it's also the fairness. I think it's principle 11 <coughs> up there. The financing of health care in Vermont must be sufficient, fair, predictable, transparent, sustainable, and shared equitably. It's one of the principles that we are here to discuss. Um, the other reason is it establishes primary care as a public good. Defining public good implies progressive financing. Now, I'd like to add that this committee and the House passed a bill that would get us down the path of, of an individual mandate. The Supreme Court determined that the individual mandate is, is a tax. It's okay. We can do it. But it's an unfair, regressive one. And poor people pay a much higher percentage. So I think we need to consider when we're considering it's OK to publicly finance when it comes to private insurance, but we don't have the same standard when it comes to people who are uninsured and, and these other things. And also, why should it be universal? Again, administrative costs are lower. And the other point that we never talk about is that we're paying the whole bill anyway. The $6 billion in health care Pick a pocket. It's either your left pocket in the form of insurance, your right pocket in the form of an out-of-pocket payment, or taxes. We're paying the entire bill. So why not make it out there and determine it publicly what, what we want to pay for and what we don't want to pay for? And again, it prevents the churning. Um, so those are the reasons that we want the original language restored. Uh, however, there is one section that we favor in the new bill, and that is striking out the money for, from, that comes from the ACO planning. And we want uh, to give the Green Mountain Care Board the money to get this work done. Um, we also favor the Green Mountain Care Board asking them to consider using excess hospital revenue when we do get universal primary care, some of those funds to be put into the primary care fund to prevent people from being hospitalized. Um, and I did include language about that. So that is pretty much a summary of my statement. Any questions? Any questions for Dr. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you identify as a primary care physician? Do I identify as yeah. one? Yes. Do you, as a primary care physician, do you think it includes more than just um, medical services, like should it also include chiropractic, for example, or other kinds of services? Yes. I, I think that when there's evidence that chiropractic care can, um, can help with certain conditions, absolutely. It also, as I want to emphasize again, should include mental health and substance abuse services. Those are actually, it is by in statute in Vermont that those services are actually included in the definition of primary care. Yes. Those all should be integrated. I also believe that part of primary care are social determinants of health, and that we need to look into that. But that's another issue we can look into right now. So, so um, would it be fair to say that universal primary care would be well, universal preventive care? It would be a much, a, much, a 
broader conception of what we're providing people. Yes. Yes. And, and I would add that there are countries that have done this. Costa Rica, which is, is should be an embarrassment to us, um, actually has a longer life expectancy and better outcomes because they do have universal primary care that does include the things that you mentioned. So I think that there are other countries that we can learn from that have done this. Spain is another one. Um, and we've found that people live longer, their costs are lower, and outcomes are better. How, how do those countries finance their systems? They're all publicly financed. They, they, it's not to say that there is no private insurance, but it's usually for the, um, the extras. Um, most countries have some form of private insurance to cover some things. But public insurance is the majority of how they fund health care. Is it their tax system? Yes. Very, again, countries differ. Some it's a, it's a payroll tax. Some it's an income tax. They have various forms of taxes depending on the country. Thanks. Am I correct in understanding that in terms of restoring the uh, language that the health, Senate Health and Welfare Committee uh, passed, which is what you're advocating for, yes. that am I correct in understanding that they did not uh, identify a financing source? That is correct. Okay. I just want to make sure that. So the money committee did not identify the money. Well, neither, neither, and the Health and Welfare Committee didn't direct any specific way to, to finance it. But well, they, they, not to finance universal primary care, but to finance the operations plan, because that's essentially the operations plan. Um, I think that might be from Nicaragua. It's Michael in Nicaragua. Um, um, they, they defined the money to start the operations plan as coming from the ACO planning money. Um, that was funded in part, I believe, by the state and the feds. So to take a portion of that. And then that is why it ended up in Senate Appropriations. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ramsey. For the record, my name is Alan Ramsey. <gasps> I am uh, a family physician. I'm here <coughs> to testify in support of the original S-53 Universal Primary Care Bill that was amended and passed uh, out of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Let me, just for those of you who don't know me, let me just make one minute talk about my credentials. Number one, I've been teaching and practicing family medicine in Vermont for 38 years. I consider myself an expert around defining the value that primary care brings to Vermonters. Number two, I practice and I'm the medical director of the People's Clinic in Barry, Vermont. I consider myself an expert on the care of those who are uninsured or underinsured. Number three, most importantly for my discussion today, I spent five years on the Green Mountain Care Board. I would argue and debate that I know more about the commercial health insurance model for financing health care services than any other physician in Vermont, having spent five years regulating premiums for commercial health insurance plans, both fathered and grandfathered, in the Affordable Care Act. Those are my credentials. So, what I'd like to do is walk you through my uh, discussion here, and I'm going to the second slide. I'm going to not spend a lot of time on because I think you're going to hear from other presenters about why we implement universal primary care. We have a system already in place that will operationalize universal primary care. We have a health care regulatory authority that no other state has, Green Mountain Care Board. Our current reform initiatives do not in any way address access to health care for the uninsured which are going to drive up costs any way you look at it. Okay? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. The second side, I want to start with discussion about public financing of universal primary care and why it is so critical. We are going to see, you are all going to deal with escalating uninsured rates in the state of Vermont I'm predicting in two years it'll be 8 to 10 percent. I'm actually changing my prediction a little bit, thinking it'll be more like 10 to 12 percent by 2020. In this state, 
10 to 12 percent of Vermonters will have no health insurance. This silver loading is a brief step, but people are going to drop out of Vermont Health Connect when they see the premiums going up and when there's no mandate. That's just the reality. People are not going to be enrolled in Medicaid because the enrollment and re-enrollment process is complicated and they just drop out. I see this at the People's Clinic every week. They say, oh, it's too complicated for me. I'll just go bare. Okay. So that's what we're facing. <clears throat> Lastly, the insurance model will never lead to universal access to health care. The insurance model. Because in the insurance model, there will always be winners and losers. And those that underrate commercial and underwrite commercial insurance for health care will always be the winners. Those rates are always going to go up. That's the reality. Now, what does commercial health insurance do well? It indemnifies us. It makes good on things that happen to us that are bad. Universal primary care is not going to take away anybody's major medical health insurance. We're all going to need it. It's just going to give people access to preventive health services that reduce the likelihood of a med major medical event. Commercial health insurance does really well in certain aspects, not in primary care. That's my argument. Now, you, next okay, slide. Dr. Renzi, yes. Do you wish to entertain questions along the way? Yes, or? absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Just a quick question um, about, I think it was on the last slide about um, the uninsured rate. Yep. Um, you know, it's a pretty bold to claim, you know, 10 to 12 percent. Is that anecdotal? Is there actuarial stuff behind that? Or where are you it, getting it, that no, number from? I'm getting that number from, it's not actuarial, okay? It's not even evidence based. It is my own personal experience of working for six years with the uninsured and seeing how it's not only the uninsured, I have people coming. I have people coming to the People's Clinic with low value, these bronze health care plans that pay for nothing, that can't afford the deductible to get an MRI that their doctor or their urgent care center has recommended to them. Okay, so it is anecdotal. I may be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I would love to be wrong. I'd love to see in 2020 that we're still at 5 or 6 percent. Okay. I just don't see that. Okay. Questions? No. Okay. Well, sorry. All right, the basic, the basic principles in the original version of S53 really have a lot to do with cost share. They really have a lot to do with how, what this bill can do to incentivize people to use the lowest cost services at the earliest point in their health care need. Okay. Not at the last point, not when that lump has gotten so big and so painful that you have to do something, okay? It incentivizes that process by taking away the cost-sharing burden. It lowers the, and, and basically we're lowering the growth in the state healthcare costs by transitioning the delivery system, system to those, to the, le the best, the least intensive and most affordable level of care. The strikeout version does not respect these principles. It addresses the administrative burden that I face every single, I could tell you stories about prior authorization that you just won't believe. I can tell you one from yesterday that you will not believe that I had to spend 30 minutes at the Vermont respite house, which we only take care of, dying patients, doing a prior authorization for Medicaid to get boost for a patient of mine, Entomet, I mean boost is a high, high protein supplement, who has a head and neck cancer that can't take anything else. I, you can't make that story up, okay? So, the next slide. Let's go on. I want to get through this because you've got a lot of testimony to Thank hear. You. Appreciate it. Questions. Now we're at the original version of S-53 was amended to assure operational and financial protections. For those of you who remember, this is the mirror of what I call the Mullen Amendments when we passed Act 48. We had to do these things before we could actually implement the program, okay? And the Greenbelt Care Board, the first 
year that I was on the board, we thought about how are we going to how are we going to achieve the goals of the Mullen amendments. Now these are a set of amendments that that follow along that same course. It has it has established. It has to um, provide specific regulatory authority, allows for a phase-in period. We're not doing this overnight. It establishes a set of conditions that are met, including stable and adequate financing, and would establish targets for a total primary care spend rate. And I want to talk about that in the next slide. In the original bill, we talked about a working group. In the strikeout bill, we talk about stakeholders, okay? I want to tell you the difference between a working group and stakeholders. I want to make sure we're yeah. talking about the same, using the yeah. same references. Right. Uh, you're talking about the original bill. You're not talking about the bills introduced. You're talking right. about the bill. I'm talking, the original the bill says a working group. Okay. Well, that's the what strikeout bill says a we, stakeholder group. I'm trying to, I simply want you to clarify which bill you're talking about when you say, because in fact, I'm correct, maybe I'm wrong. There was a bill is introduced. The bill is passed by Senate Health and Welfare. And the bill is passed by the Senate coming out of uh, And you heard and you had so, readings of both bills on Friday. We did. Okay, good. But I'm just when you refer uh, okay. to which All right. is let me refer to the Senate Health and Welfare Bill, which is, which establishes a working group. All right. I like that. No, fine. I'm just, I just, okay. I'm just trying to clarify. Let me refer so to, what referring to when. the strikeout bill passed by the Senate, which talks about a stakeholder group. Yeah, the strike all amendment. Yeah, the strike all amendments. Stakeholder. You know, one oh. of the things in the italics there are that you know, I, that the Green Mountain Care Board would convene a stakeholder group. Now, I have a lot of experience with stakeholder groups and the Green Mountain Care Board because I convened one when you pass the bill to develop a prior authorization pilot program four years ago, five years ago, okay. It began as a stakeholder group and nothing got done for six or seven months because stakeholders have a stake in things and the insurers had a big stake in changing the prior authorization rule. Okay. Finally I said, okay, if we can't do anything, I'll go back to the legislature and, and they'll give me some guidance. And they hope now we became a working group. When I said that, we became a working group. We passed a pilot around prior authorization. Now, you guys are the stakeholders here. We don't need a stakeholder group. You are elected to do this work. You are the stakeholders that represent Vermonters. A working group is a group that is convened in the original Senate Health, Web, Health, Senate Health and Welfare Bill to actually do the work to operationalize universal primary care. So there was a big difference. I don't think people understand there's a big difference between saying those two things in two different bills. A financing plan. Now, there was no mention in the Senate passed strikeout bill of a primary care spend rate. Which would, have, which would be an essential component to financing universal primary care. Where every entity, whether you're an ACO, a hospital, an insurer, says we spend this percent on primary care and we will increase that percent a certain amount to achieve the goals of universal primary care. That's primary care spend rate. Ask one care, what is their primary care spend rate? They don't know. The Green Mountain Care Board right now is working on that product, on that process. They will do that work. So a financing plan has to include a primary care defined primary care spend rate and a primary care trust fund. And there is model legislation about how that could be done. Remember, this is six, seven percent of the total spend. <laughs> in the state. Six to seven percent of the total spend of six billion dollars goes to primary care. It's totally inadequate, but until we define it and start regulating it, we won't achieve any goals. Um, 
I think you're going to hear about the Rhode Island small state financial evidence to support universal a universal primary care program where they actually in 2010 required commercial health insurers to increase their allocation to primary care by 1% a year for five years. My understanding of the debate in the legislature when that law was passed is as you expect, the commercial insurers felt the sky would fall if we had to do that, if we had to regulate to increasing primary care spending. But what we found after five years is increasing that primary care, commercial rate primary care spend by 1% a year led to an 18% drop in total spending. In that five year period. In that five year period. And I think the commercial insurers now, they're continuing that program and they're very enthusiastic. I don't know, we don't have a final report in the last four years, but they're quite enthusiastic. And that's a small state that took this legislative approach in 2010. Quite a couple questions, Dan Marie and then Brian. Brian. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Was, was there a reason that the it dropped eighteen <laughs> percent? I mean, you're you're saying this is yeah. we did this and this happened. Yeah. I mean, is there? Well, it's either utilization or price structure. Utilization times price is cost. Okay. It is unlikely that utilization went down in a small state like Rhode Island. They don't have a huge population. They didn't have a delivery system like we have. Okay. I suspect that it led to the commercial insurers looking at how they set their prices and paid their... The there was no, no study. No, no, here we go. We, don't, we don't know that. De I don't know okay. that detail. Just checking. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, I have two questions, I think. One is, do you happen to know the population of Rhode Island? It's twice. <coughs> yeah, it's about a million, too. Okay. Yeah. And do you know how many commercial insurers are involved in the system in Rhode Island? No, I don't. I know in Vermont there's a lot, but we have like two, ma two major yeah. ones. But I mean, there are a lot, right? Because right. there's all these other, all these plans for the people. Have they have an them. insurance commission. Okay. But it doesn't have quite the authority that the Green Mountain Care Board does. I know that much about it. I, I'd be curious to learn more about this, not necessarily from you, but I don't know if there's other witnesses that, yes, that could Yes, we are going to hear other witnesses that are going to talk about this. Okay. okay. From Rhode Island, I believe. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. uh, okay. yeah, this morning. <laughs> Do, can we estimate in the next slide potential universal primary care savings? There is no actuarial way to estimate this amount. <clears throat> okay. So all we can say is one. All we can say is, could we, by increasing the primary care spend rate from six to seven percent to ten percent, could we reduce the total prime total health care spend in the state? If we took the total spend, which is around six billion dollars, a one percent reduction. You know, I've, I've listed it'd be 51 million. A 10% reduction would be 513 million dollars a year. If we took just the hospital expenditures, just the total hospital spending, and we increased that spend rate to 10%, I went I went through the same numbers with the income of those. And I will say that the accountable care organization model, which is basically dominating our healthcare reform landscape right now, has not shown meaningful healthcare savings. You all must know that. You probably know that. In the Medicare Shared Savings Program. We hope they will. We hope they'll stay within a 3.5% to the all care model. We hope. It's, it's going to be a big stretch. Next slide, and we're almost done. The Senate strikeout version, S-53. It's not meaningful legislation. 
it is not meaningful legislation compared to what came out of the policy, the primary two-year policy debate that occurred in Senate Health and Welfare. It proposes a study of the feasibility. That's exactly what we have done for two years in the Senate, is we've established the feasibility of universal primary care. It suggests private insurance income sensitized cost sharing will increase utilization of primary care services. This is an extraordinary statement from so to someone who has looked at how premiums are established in the commercial health insurance market for five years. This would drive premiums up for all of us without any hope. <laughs> and, and if you don't think they're gonna be, a, it's a trouble now, Wait till they get, wait till the, the projected premiums are presented to the Green Mountain Care Board in six weeks with the flu epidemic, okay, with uh, risk insurance, with risk corridors gone. I mean, fasten your seatbelts in terms of premiums. And now we're talking about income sent, insurance income sensitized cost sharing. I mean, from someone that's looked at premium increases for five years, I'm very concerned about that kind of proposal. Um, again, we talked about insurance models of healthcare coverage have never led to universal access. Convenes a group of interested stakeholders. We talked about the difference between stakeholders in the strikeout version and what a true working group would do. And those stakeholders already are doing well in the healthcare system. Has anybody looked at the results of the actual results of the hospital budgets from 2017? The Green Mountain Care Board is struggling in developing proposals as we speak for how to deal with the revenue excesses that have been de declared in, in the actual budget for 2017. Those who oppose, next slide, those who oppose, either oppose or do not support the original S53 bill. You know, first it was the Appropriations Committee. I sat through that two hour session, but only 20 minutes, 20 minutes were spent on the Senate Health and Welfare bill with minimal actual discussion about appropriations. This was the Appropriations Committee striking out a bill, adding language at the last minute. <laughs> and I was there to hear about appropriations, not about striking out meaningful policy that came out of a policy committee that took testimony from the public. Yes. So, you're, you're making clear. You're clearly making the case that you don't support what happened in the <laughs> Senate. This is clear. If we can. We can. We can. Stipulate. Case we yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we can stipulate to the fact that we don't really need. Uh, Thank you for your intuitiveness. Yeah, we'll stipulate the fact that you don't support. Yeah. That. Okay. What I would like to ask is, uh, and you do support what the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Yes. Yeah. If, if the legislature stakeholders, as you indicated, if the stakeholders conclude not to support what the Senate Health and Welfare Committee did, is it your view that it's important to not go forward with what the Senate passed? Or is that, I mean, that, that really, that we need to cut to the chase here and say, right. okay, I mean, we got, we got it. You, you, you're disappointed, more than disappointed, you're upset. Uh, the Senate Health and Welfare Committee took a step in the direction, perhaps not fully in the direction that you wished it had. Uh, we haven't really talked about that, but that is, for at this point, that's become somehow the gold standard. Uh, and, 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 and what you're hoping and what Dr. Richter indicated we should, we should try to reestablish here in order to try to move this process forward in the manner that you really believe strongly should happen. But absent that, I'd ask you to comment on 
whether you think there's any value in going forward with what the Senate has passed, or should we do nothing at this point, or should or should we do something else? Because right right now it's set up as a uh, binary choice of either or, either or, and of course you know in this building it's not either or. Uh, but uh, but I do want to ask you about the or, uh, because you're making a strong case for what the Senate Health and Welfare Committee did, and mm -hmm. frankly I don't know I I could not tell you what this group of stakeholders will choose to do. Uh, but we, we will be trying hard over the next period of days, because we don't have weeks and weeks, but we have days, to sort through some of this. And it would be helpful to me to have a sense from you and from Dr. Richter, who I meant to ask the same question previously, and I would still ask you to comment. For all of, can I, can I answer that? Please. Just in, in best so Please. I'm, I'm here to represent my family colleagues throughout the state, particularly in the rural areas of the state, particularly those that have been so burdened in the last eight, six or seven years by measures, by performance standards, by um, utilization control, by prior authorization. I'm here to represent, primarily to represent them. In that, in that sense, I would support any effort to keep this alive. Okay. I would like to move it, I'm a hospice, but I'd like to move it from life, from hospice to at least to some sort of palliative care. Okay. Or, I would like to achieve that. So that my, my answer is that if I'm here to speak for the Vermont chapter, the American Academy of Family Physicians, of which I'm a delegate to the National Conference or an associate delegate. I would have to say, give us anything that we can say to my colleagues. We're doing the best we can. We're not going to let this hospice die. We're going to keep it alive a little longer. On the other hand, I came to you with a set of credentials that I had hoped would establish a little more debate around Policy. That's my hope. That was my hope. Okay. So, I appreciate that. Yes. And at some point, I'd like Dr. Richter to yeah. be able to weigh in as well because I think that is a. Fair well, I can. It's a, just a brief statement. Please. If we're using the patient analogy. Well, I'm. You're. This you, patient. You can choose to. I, I like using patient analogies, and in my view, this version, the patient is brain dead. Um, they're on life support, but they're not alive, and this is, has no chance of doing anything meaningful. It just, I believe, gives legislators a feeling that they did something about primary care, and it's the frustrations of Vermonters. Every time that we end up with another study that ends up getting shelved, I think it's better off dying if that's the case. So you'll need to consult with your medical colleagues at, <laughs> and for around the patient situation, and we have ethics people who can help you with that. Yes. Uh, I'm going to drop that analogy. I think it's helpful to a point. I really want to run with the analogy and say that I would love to restore the chromosomes and bring the patient completely back to their prime. But um, that being said, I'm curious, um, you witnessed what happened in appropriations. From your perspective, why did this change occur? Like, what happened? What did you see? I'm not, Representative Cena, I'm not a politician by any sense of it. You know, you've heard me today. This is not, I'm not, okay. I think that uh, there was, my sense is that there was a preconceived decision, even knowing that we had a majority of senators committed to voting yes, affirmative, on the original Senate Health and Welfare Bill I think there was a decision made even before it got to appropriations that uh, that was not in the best interest of Vermonters. Uh, that's the best I can say. Okay, <laughs> lastly, um, well, those who oppose, you know, you can read through this. Uh, again, I will, um, I will just say finally that uh, we have a workforce crisis. We have done nothing, nothing 
substantially to address the primary care workforce crisis. There's no evidence that this would address that crisis. But there's no evidence that it wouldn't. Okay, And no one has argued this being the, the universal primary care. Nobody has argued or effectively contested that universal primary care could be a way to attract primary care physicians and more students into primary care careers. We have some evidence from Dartmouth Medical School. I have some evidence from the National AAFP Congress that it would. Okay, <clears throat> Unless we address that crisis, we will have a system where primary care in five years, again, another prediction, I don't, I can't, I don't have evidence on this, but I'm just based on my experience for 38 years, we will receive our primary care in the next five to 10 years at urgent health, at retail clinics, or on the internet. That's where we will get our primary care unless we address this primary care and mental health crisis. I think the legislature spent a lot of time into the mental health crisis, and that's great. But it's broader than that. So, um, and no testimony has disputed universal primary care is, com is incompatible with our current health care reform efforts. The affordable, I mean, the accountable care organization, all payer waiver. There's no one that's to be, that has contested that it's not, that it is incompatible with what we're already doing. So, I, that, that's all I can Maybe explore that at another point. Yeah. I'm, I'm concerned in terms of our time with Yeah, this. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'm just, but we taking some of the time as well. But um, are there immediate questions then? Uh, <clears throat> workforce is something that we deal with in our community. Sure. And a lot of communities do. So I'm interested in this. Would it be possible to get a um, copy of this, the survey, the Dartmouth surveys? Some oh, of yeah. Comments? Yeah, I can, be interested yeah, I can send it to you. Yeah. We actually did a UVM survey, too, and we were trying to collate the two. Yeah. And, and let me try and get that together and I'll send it to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think Dr. Ramsey, I think uh, Representative Donahue has a question. Oh. Uh, you know, I think you have more experience and knowledge on the whole financial complexity end than a, a lot of our, our witnesses because of your time on the Green Mountain Care Board. And, you know, we have a RAM report that really drilled down into where the dollars are all flowing. And roughly 30% is through net federal inflow, not just Medicaid, but you know all sorts of net. So, have you looked at, um, or how much have you looked at, how the complexities of the federal inflow would align into working out this model without losing any of that? I mean, 30% of our care, we're getting subsidized by the rest of the country right now. 30% of the cost. Um, well, that's a great question. Medicaid, you know, again, is a program. If you have full Medicaid coverage, you have first dollar coverage for your primary care services. Medicare is different. And there are many, many of your Medicare constituents that are concerned about this bill because they've paid into Medicare, they're paying into Part B. And now they feel like if there's any general fund allocation, I'm going to pay into it for something that, you know, I may or may not benefit from. You know, that's a reality. Uh, many, uh, and, and we'd have to deal with that reality as we looked at the, the, at the total financing plan. So we've got the Medicaid, we've got the Medicare. I think that we would have to work fairly closely with CMMI or CMMS to establish this process through our all-payer waiver? Yeah, I, I'm not talking about yeah. Medicare or okay. Medicaid. I'm talking about all of the vast other oh. federal inflow of dollars and how we ensure that we don't lose any of that sure. if it's paying 30% yeah. of our bill okay. right now. Again, and that, that is one of the things that led to the one of the amendments during the Senate Health and Welfare debate is that we would have to assure that this would not diminish the flow of dollar, federal dollars into the state in any way. Okay. That involves, you know, uh, tax benefits, tax benefits, employers, ERISA, health savings account, health, health savings account, or, or, you know, don't worry about that. There are health resource accounts that are owned by the companies, but we don't have many of those in Vermont, so there's, there's a lot. Okay, great, thank you. So I'm not 
Uh, sure, I did not organize the witness list, so I'm going to turn to Lori to help me understand. So is Herb Olson, Herb, are you on the line? Is Michael Fine on the line? I am on the line. Okay. Um, do you, why don't we turn to you and uh, hear from you since you're on the line? And if Herb Olson, uh, is he expected to join the conference at some point? Okay. Why don't we hear from uh, Dr. Fine? And uh, I'm going to open it up to you to make comment. Oh, we don't have a specific set of questions for you, but obviously you're looking to comment on the bill as it's coming from the Senate. And also the Rhode Island. Um, right. Well, I'm assuming yeah. that. I'm assuming that's because. Uh, why, why don't you start by identifying yourself for our record and introducing yourself to the committee, and then sharing um, sure. some uh, relatively brief comments only because of our times. But we are interested in hearing from you. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I'll be uh, as brief as I can. Uh, I'm Mr. Chairman, Mr. Speaker, today is a great honor to uh, appear, however, just in the before you. I'm sitting in San Juan del Sur, Nicaragua, where I'm doing immersion uh, Spanish uh, so that I can better work with the members of the population. But, uh, can you, can can you, can you try to speak up some? Our, our, it's going to be. If you can over speak, if you will, to speak more loudly than you think is comfortable, it might help us and we'll kind of coach you along the way because right now I don't think most people can hear. Okay, how's that, this? That's this significantly better. better. That's significantly better. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm, uh, I was the director of the Rhode Island Department of Health between 2011 and 2015. I'm a family physician. I'm now the chief health strategist for the city of Central Falls, Rhode Island, and the clinical and population health officer uh, for Blackstone Valley Community Health Care, a large community health center uh, in Blackstone Valley in the northern part of Rhode Island. Uh, together, the city and Blackstone Valley Health Care are building the first neighborhood health station in the United States uh, where we will provide urgent care primary care, mental behavioral health care, oral health, physical therapy, and the EMS for the entire population of the city of Central Falls to help get at uh, some of the same issues that universal primary care will get at in Vermont. Um, and I'm really here to testify mostly about universal primary care. I really don't have specific information about the various versions of the bills. Um, when we talk about universal primary care, there are really two challenges that we're hoping to solve. Um, the first is to improve population health, and the second is to reduce the cost. Um, to improve population health, we really need to include everyone in prevention. Now, in Rhode Island, about 55% of people get primary care. People have access to health insurance, but only about 55% of people actually use that health insurance for primary care. And of those, uh, 50 to 70% or less get the recommended preventive activities um, that they need in order to maintain their health as individuals. And that together represents a significant public health failure um, because that means we're bringing prevention only to 25 to 35 or 40 percent of the population as a whole. Prevention becomes meaningful when we include everyone. And we have so far, as uh, the state of Rhode Island and as a nation, failed to be able to do that. Um, when most of the population gets prevention, we get the biggest uh, effect from a population. Uh, um, and, and uh, the other major challenge that we look to address is, in fact, the challenge of cost, as you've heard about already. Um, the real challenge on the cost side is that we don't really have a health care system and uh, we don't have ways to help people understand how to get the kind of care they need at, in the time that they need in a way that's most cost effective. So, 
Uh, many people use emergency departments that don't need them. Many people get hospitalized when they didn't need to be hospitalized. Many people use EMS um, when they didn't need EMS. In Rhode Island, 50% um, of all emergency department utilization is what's called primary care sensitive. Could have been taken care of in a primary care uh, situation. And the difference in the cost of each of those visits is astronomical. Uh, a, a single primary care visit uh, for a uh, relatively routine medical problem might cost as much as 100 or $150. You take the same problem, a headache or a back pain, you take the same problem to an emergency department and the cost becomes $5,000 to $10,000 or more, and that's if the person didn't get admitted to the hospital. Um, in Rhode Island, 10 to 20 percent of all hospital admissions um, are likely unnecessary or could be could have been addressed in a primary care environment, and 70 percent of emergency medical services um, are for uh, problems that could have been addressed in a primary care office. And the problem that we all face together is that. Uh, most people don't have access to primary care in the communities in which they live and the way they know how to use them. Um, and so they go to the default opportunity, which is EMS, emergency departments, and hospitals, and that whole process generates huge costs. As some of you, I'm sure, know, as a nation, we estimate that 30 to 50 percent of all our costs are unnecessary which means that as a nation, we spend uh, something like a trillion dollars a year that we didn't need to spend. Uh, and that's why we consistently uh, rank in terms of cost. We, we spend twice as much as the average of the other industrialized nations in the world, and our outcomes are relatively poor. Let me talk for a moment about the Rhode Island experience, um, which I've had the opportunity to opportunity to be pretty involved with. Um, I think you've heard the basic numbers. Uh, the Rhode Island primary care spent work has been reasonably effective, um, but it is not effective enough because the authority, the regulatory authority of the health insurance commissioner extends only to people involved in commercial health insurance plans. And in Rhode Island, 44% of people with uh, private insurance um, are enrolled through the ERISA process um, so that we actually haven't had jurisdiction, the Health Insurance Commissioner hasn't had jurisdiction over the bulk of the population of the state. Even so, we've seen real change in the, uh, the character and effectiveness of our primary care delivery system um, since uh, the Health Insurance Commissioner increased the primary care spend from what was then five to what is now about 11 percent. Um, but part of the reason we're working on our own primary care trust legislation, which is modeled on the same legislation that's before you, is to make sure we find a way to extend that process and include um, the entire population of the state uh, so that not only the spend improves, but also to, also to give us the opportunity to continue to work on the delivery system itself. Uh, we want to make sure that every community has access to a primary care practice that's open from 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 at night and open on weekends. And for us, the primary care trust uh, is the way to do that. Um, and I'm actually going to be testifying before our House, House and Senate committees um, over the next couple of weeks as soon as I come home. Um, to uh, help people think this through. Let me pause and open for questions. So can I just, uh, this is uh, Representative Lippert, the chair. I just wanted, so this is helpful to, to put in context, as I, to be honest, was not entirely clear of what the Rhode Island experience is. What you've done in Rhode Island is to increase the spend on primary care, but in the commercial, uh, for the commercial carriers, but you, you're not, you're not, yet achieved or you've not achieved uh, public financing of primary care for all, all persons in Rhode Island. That's something that's still uh, on the agenda. 
but in correct, but, that's but, what we're working on now. Right, I understand. Okay, but in but in increasing the spend for primary care, what you're testifying to, as did Dr. Ramsey earlier, but you, given that your direct experience is that there has been a significant drop in total spending, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, 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 I, I, I don't, I'm not looking at exactly the same numbers Dr. Lance used, um, but we have certainly seen a drop in spending for the Medicare population, um, which is the, the spending, the, the population where the opportunity is probably greatest, um, because that's where the cost is greatest. And we've seen a real change in uh, what the delivery system looks like. Um, we've seen, uh, primary care physicians do a little better financially. Um, we've had uh, a lot less trouble recruiting. Um, and uh, we've seen many expanded opportunities for people to get primary care connected to urgent care uh, on nights and weekends. Um, and, and that's where uh, this is going to benefit us long term. Um, and that's why we keep trying to develop this sector. So can I, can I interrupt just for a minute and say that this is helpful me, for me in terms of trying to clarify how to move forward here and what testimony is going to be helpful or not helpful. It, it occurs to me that the testimony that I'm hearing from you is in the direction of making the case for the value of primary care. I would personally stipulate I don't need testimony about that personally, but I don't know that other committee members may. And so I'm just, as, as, as the chair, I'm sitting here thinking, like, what, what is the testimony that we need at this point to make decisions about how to move forward? And so at the, I'm just going to name that, and at some point, I'm going to turn to our committee to try to articulate what are the, what are the questions that we as a committee need testimony on that we need to, to help us resolve the questions that, for some of us, it, can, can, I, can I just sort of respond a little bit? So I'm not really trying to testify about the value of primary care. Okay, well, that's what I, maybe I misunderstood. That, that generally well understood. Um, what I'm really testifying about is the value of making primary care universal. Okay. Um, what, what we have seen <laughs> is uh, lots, mountains of evidence about the value of primary care itself, but we haven't had much public discussion about the importance of uh, bringing that to the entire population, um, both from a public health impact, from a public health, uh, uh, for public health reasons, um, and also for cost reasons. Um, we have allowed the market character of our system, um, or the market, or, or the character of our market, because we don't really have a system, um, to, uh, to, to kind of marginate the primary care process. Instead of, instead of putting it in the center of what we do from a public policy perspective. And, and I think universal primary care and the primary care trust legislation is there um, to make sure that we get to including the entire population um, because when we do that, that's when we get the value of primary care from a public health and cost perspective. If we don't make it universal and we don't work hard to make it universal, um, it's its, uh, its advantages uh, will stay theoretical. Um, but it's the job of public policy, I think, uh, to take those theoretical advantages and make them real. Thank you, and I appreciate the distinction you're making. And I would, just so you have a sense, I perhaps misspoke when I said the value of primary care. I was, in my mind, thinking the value of universally accessible primary care, as, as you've articulated. I think Representative Chin has a question, Wait, and then, uh, or yeah, I have a question. Um, you mentioned you you've talked about the connection between primary care and urgent care, and about how people having greater access um, save money. And I'm curious, where does mental health fit into that in Rhode Island? Like, are primary care providers um, is that increased access to primary care while also addressing mental health challenges? We are doing everything we can to integrate mental health into the primary care process. Um, and uh, the, the neighborhood health station I talked about um, has those two areas completely integrated. 
um, so that we have mental health workers working shoulder to shoulder with primary care clinicians, um, seeing patients every day. Um, we've developed a technology of warm handoffs, um, and we make sure that everybody who presents to a primary care clinician with a mental behavioral issue or a substance uh, use disorder issue um, gets those issues addressed at the time of the primary care visit. Now that hasn't become universal in Rhode Island yet, um, but we've got a number of folks who are working on it, and many of our community health centers have achieved full integration already. That's the direction that we're going, and from my perspective, that's the direction we must go if we're going to be effective at helping people change behavior, the, the behaviors they need to change to uh, create the best health outcomes. And it's also the only way we're going to be able to begin to control costs and begin to dial back the very difficult problems that we face with substance use disorder and opiate both their steps. How does, oh, I'm sorry. Right. Right. So just to follow up, I'm curious about the connect. So in Vermont, like we, we have, we have a backlog in our emergency rooms of people needing mental health services, and there's a lot of factors involved, but it's common here for people to be sent to the emergency room when they're in a crisis. In Rhode Island, is, is it any different? Like, can, do people go to the ER? Or can they come to the urgent care, primary care center? I'm curious, like in terms of crisis level work, where um, the universal access to primary care might, might be helping or might not make a difference? It's, it's usually different, and I, I, I'm going to speak with a little pride about it's different now that I'm hearing about how things are in Vermont. Um, we, uh, all our primary care, well, all our community health centers, for sure, and many of our primary care practices um, are ready to deal with mental health issues when they uh, present. Um, in addition, we have, a, uh, we have two large mental health organizations that have really developed capacity for uh, immediate response um, so that when someone presents to the emergency department uh, in mental health crisis and then they are met at the emergency department with the mental health clinician and that mental health clinician in initiates treatment right away. Um, we've really got a number of layers of sophisticated mental health address um, so that these two areas are now, uh, are now functioning um, together. We don't see them as separate. Um, we see them as one and the same. I think, I think we, I want to turn to Representative Briggs who has a question. And, and then we're, are there any final comments from Dr. Fine? Um, Dr. Fine, this is Tim Brigland. Um, a question I have in terms of the road that Rhode Island has gone down with um, um, requiring commercial insurers to increase the proportion of uh, of medical costs allocated to primary care by 1% a year. I, I'm, I'm trying to picture what that looks like. What actually happens to, to, to drive that result? And um, what, what are the things that either the primary care system or commercial insurers are doing to, to achieve a higher, I guess, percentage of of costs um, being directed at, at primary care services? That's, that's a great question. Um, the initial driver was our health insurance commissioner. Um, he was one of the few uh, dedicated health insurance commissioners in the United States. I think there are only one or two states that also have a pure health insurance commissioner. Um, and as the health insurance commissioner uh, wrote his regulation, um, he involved the commercial insurers in the process, um, made clear what the targets were, um, and then created a uh, reporting and audit process, um, making sure that uh, what counted was also made clear to insurers. And the way insurers addressed it was, they addressed it in a number of different ways. Um, first, they uh, began to participate much more actively in a multi-payer uh, patient-centered medical home process, um, which brought uh, small capitated payments to primary care practices who are doing case management, participating in the multi-payer uh, patient-centered medical home process. So that now 
more than 50% of our primary care practices uh, participate in that practice and in, in that process. Um, that's been a major step, um, and that required specific investment by health insurers in that per person per month uh, payment for care management, which didn't exist before. Um, they participated as well uh, in the uh, in the electronic uh, 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 the shared record system. Um, it hasn't worked as well as we hoped, but but uh, we tried to make sure that at least electronic information uh, through through our health insurance our health information exchange um, was available to everyone. Um, and then, you know, they obviously have the opportunity to look at their own fee schedule um, and see whether there are opportunities to improve reimbursement itself. Um, we have targeted, as many people across the country have targeted, we have targeted moving to a more value-based uh, payment system, um, trying to tilt the balance more towards capitated payments um, and less toward fee-for-service. Uh, part of the rationale behind our uh, primary care trust legislation is to move that process along because it's been going way too slow. Um, we think that uh, we really need to get that, to get primary care capitated. Um, and that's, that's a, another discussion, but when you do that, it saves 20 to 40 percent uh, off the top because of the cost of billing as it now exists. Um, but it's been, you know, iterative uh, with reporting and oversight um, and uh, lots of communication, um, making sure that everybody was and stayed at the table. So I, I want to play some of that back to you in layman's terms, because I think I understand most of what you said, but it sounds like what you have done regulatorily in Rhode Island is um, uh, kind of direct the, the supply side of the equation in terms of um, what um, what primary care services, you mentioned uh, medical homes, are available, um, you know, what are being supplied to, um, you know, Rhode Island patients. Um, you only mentioned a little bit in terms of kind of the demand side, in terms of, um, pr you know, for example, pricing of um, primary care services. One of the things we're considering here in universal care is they would be costless to consumers, which would um, you know make those services more available. Um, so that you know this is addressing you know to some extent more of the demand side, uh, making it easier for people to access um, care from a pricing perspective. Yeah, I, I can't tell you we've thought a lot about the demand side. Um, I think our focus has, has been uh, developing the delivery, the primary care delivery system, and making sure it's both available and responsive, um, and using the regulatory process to encourage change. And that works because everybody has to play on the same level playing field. That leveling of the playing field I think has been a pretty important part of, of what we've done on, on what you're calling the supply side. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, I can't tell you I know what changing the demand side would do, but I can't see that making access through the demand side better. I mean, to me, that seems like a real opportunity. Um, because remember what I, as I said before, and I don't know what the numbers are in Vermont, but 55% of people in Rhode Island who take that health insurance um, don't, only 55% of the people with the best health insurance have in regular use primary care. Um, so part of our challenge has been uh, to, to make sure there are primary care practices for people to go to, but incentivizing people to get there seems like an important part of the equation. Thank you. Okay. I think um, if you have a final comment, or perhaps those are your final comments, uh, I think we need to stop for now. Uh, but appreciate your participating because it opens our eyes to kind of hear, hear some of what other 
another small state in New England is doing to address some of the issues of primary care. Um, so. No, no comments other than thank you for considering this question. Uh, it's a very important which is really important if we're going to figure out how to create a healthcare system for the United States, uh, affordable um, and effective, something we haven't yet done. Thanks right. again. Right. Well, th thank you. Um, <coughs> let me just check and see if Herb Olson has joined the conference call in the meantime. Herb, are you on the conference call? Okay, I think what we're going to do is to turn to Dr. Deppie. Uh, and uh, hear from her, and then we'll see whether we can circle back and connect with uh, her also at some other point in time. Do you want to, Brian, can you, or Tim, can you help make sure that's off? Yeah, because otherwise, we'll... I don't know if you want to stay on. Excuse me. No, he's not going to. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good morning. Well, good morning. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm Dr. Susan Deppie. I practice psychiatry in Colchester in private practice. I have a small practice. Um, let me open with, since that reminds me, that capitation will not work in a small practice it's because I have a tiny practice and one or two very difficult people with a lot of time could really upset the apple cart. So something like hourly, being paid hourly, which is practically what I'm doing in private practice anyway, or something else might be a better mechanism for that. Perhaps salaries or, you know, whatever. Um, I, I want to affirm what Drs. Richter and Ramsey said. I think it's um, incredibly important. Um, I have Dr. Ramsey beat, however, I think my longest pre-certification for somebody to get them into the hospital took me about two hours on the phone with someone, and um, they were suggesting ridiculous things that were 20 years out of date. Um, I think we need to make it publicly funded and make it extremely streamlined. Um, mental health and substance abuse, as you guys well know, and I appreciate um, Representative uh, Brian's comments, um, is a key piece of that and will help you save money um, because there's a cost shift when you don't provide mental health and substance abuse as well. Um, just another comment and before I get to my major couple of points. With respect to Medicare, I still have people who um, have primary, Medicare is primary and they have a commercial secondary and they're still paying deductibles at the beginning of the year. And they may still have co-payments. So don't assume that if somebody has a secondary commercial policy, they're getting a good deal. In psychiatry, they often do not. Um, the, um, I would echo what, what Deb and Alan said in terms of going back to the Senate Health and Welfare version and having that work group be really knowledgeable about what it's like in the trenches, including patients and especially physicians, psychiatrists, primary care physicians. Dr. Ramsey's comment about the burdensome administrative piece is incredibly important and I think has been a big piece of why people in primary care and psychiatry have retired or given up on trying to deal with insurance. Many of us, many of my colleagues don't take commercial insurance, um, even Medicare and Medicaid. I do, but this isn't about money or taxes. This is an investment, as Dr. Ramsey said. And I think we're already spending the money. We need to think of it that way. Do we want to be intelligent about how we're spending Vermonters money? I think there's your answer for people who say we don't have the money. Well, if we don't spend the money to invest, we're spending it anyway, and in a very foolish way. Um, it's prevention treatment, reducing suffering, which is a huge value for Vermonters, I think, for each other. Other costs and tax, burden, tax burdens, I suspect, would drop under universal primary care, although I, I am not a financial analyst. But how could your school, town, and state employee costs or Medicaid or corrections costs not drop if you are providing service at the cheapest point or as early as possible? We already have the data on primary care doing that. So it's going to affect other taxes in a positive way. If insurers are not covering primary care, their premiums are going to go down. They have to go down. They have to be regulated down. Um, to avoid becoming another burdensome insurance, this can't be just another insurance that's layered on top. 
it really needs to be a comprehensive, this is how we pay primary care and we have to make a little juggling for Medicare or whatever we can't include, but it needs to include as much of the insurance system as possible, including hopefully Medicaid. Um, which I don't find that hard to deal with, frankly, compared to Medicare and God save us, Medicare D, the drug programs and the precincts are ridiculous. Um, so universal primary care has to really cover everything that's normally done in our offices. And in the community, perhaps nursing homes or however they want to do it for primary care, um, at all of those settings that are not hospital based or not intensive you know, mid-level services like in psychiatry where you have a day program or something would not necessarily be covered. But it needs to cover everything we do so that the billing is sleek, it's less hassle for the clinicians, and, you know, it would work more better. Exceptions have to be extremely rare or you're going to lose the administrative efficiency of having a publicly funded system. The primary care and, and, and the psychiatry private practice workforces are collapsing. We have largely had troubles with low reimbursement and the massive administration burdens. We were attacked by managed care in the 1990s before primary care was, and it was quite egregious. One of my colleagues has uncovered a, paper, a report that indicates that in the 1990s, or since managed care started, started around 1990 when I entered practice, um, that the proportion, the percent of the total paid to psychiatry dropped 50% in those first few years, I think about a decade. I don't have the study in front of me, but 50%, bang, devalued. That was a fairly, uh, shall we say, unwise uninvestment. So we are, people are, I have a colleague who's retiring. He gets, he's been getting 1,000 referrals a year, taking very few of them. He's a wonderful psychiatrist. He now has 140 patients. He has to refer somewhere. He sees some fairly complex stuff, as I do. You know, where are they going to go? There are so few of us in primary practice, in private practice, compared to when I started here in 1990. It's unbelievable. Or in the 80s, actually, I moved to Burlington. There were tons of psychiatrists. So, and of course, child psychiatry, you guys have probably heard, has been extremely painful because there just aren't the resources. Um, so it has to be minimal administrative burden. Let people do their jobs bump the reimbursement so it's commensurate with the rest of the system because it still isn't. And more clinicians would want to practice here, more psychiatrists would want to practice here as well as primary care docs. Um, back when we passed um, the single payer bill, we had something like over 200, this is not psychiatry, but over 200 medical students and physicians who said they would like to move to Vermont if we passed it. Well, we passed it, but then we didn't actualize it. So people would want to come if the system is a decent system to work under. We just have to keep it streamlined, and you can't be measuring everything to death, as Dr. Ramsey said. So if it's done right, it would strengthen our clinical workforce. Um, that was. Pretty much, the, Alan did come back to that, that comment, and I think that's really important. Um, so that's what I had. I'd be happy to take any questions I can from the private practice psychiatry trenches. Okay. Questions for Dr. Debbie? <laughs> I've, got, I've got a general question. Yes. It's not necessarily directed at you, but you brought up some of the administrative um, you know, challenges that you currently face. and. It's a broad question that I'd be interested in hearing other people talk to as well, which is, um, is, uh, is this system that you're envisioning one that is fee-for-service? So you, the payer who ultimately pays you for the, for the work you do with patients um, is, is going to be on, a, on an as-seen basis, or do you see this evolving to a, some sort of capitated payment? Frankly, my own opinion is that fee-for-service isn't a bad thing in private practice psychiatry. Mm -hmm. In primary care psychiatry, it would be fine. I, I mean, it's hard to get a patient to sign up for $2,000 worth of therapy they don't want mm -hmm. or don't need, you know. Um, I, 
I think most of us, that I don't think there's a lot of abuse of, say, you know, sending people for procedures that they don't need. I usually don't write for my own CT scans anyway. I usually work for my primary care docs to get an MRI or CT or something. Sure. So I think fee-for-service would work fine. I think for many people who work more hours than I do because I'm very part-time with a lot of other things going on, um, for folks that work more hours, if they wanted to be on salary or whatever, there could be a number of mechanisms. Um, I don't think it needs to be capitated because capitation has the risk of really cranking down on being able to do what the patient needs. And in a small practice, the numbers just don't work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. I think we're gonna continue to, we have, um, let's see, it's kind of we have a number of witnesses that Trying to get to still this morning. Uh, Ken, Machine Mountain Care Board, thank you. Um, and, and again, I'm going to pull our attention to the bill before us from the Senate, as well as the bill that was, came out of the Senate Health and Welfare. And so I'm welcome you to comment on the role of Machine Mountain Care Board or if there's any perspective you wish to talk about as it's included or not included in each bill. Uh, for the record, Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, with me is Gene Snedder, our business manager. Welcome, and, um, I would say there's much to talk about. Um, we can confine it to those constraints and we can talk about bigger picture. Um, well, I don't think we're, I mean, I mean, when you say bigger picture, I mean, mm -hmm. we could spend, yep. we, and we will be spending months around issues of healthcare generally in our care board, but this is really focused on the yeah. Uh, the bill that's coming to us from the Senate and uh, S-53 and or the bill that came out of the Senate Health and Welfare and I think <coughs> really, that's really what this committee needs to I, I do want to take the on. opportunity though to jump on what Dr. Ramsey said earlier. Okay, that's fine. And um, we've had this conversation in the past in this committee, but it's about workforce. And I, I still feel like people are not addressing the, the, the key issue of working with higher education to turn out more primary care practitioners. And um, I just want to update this committee that the head of the nurses union, um, Deb Snell, has reached out to Castle University and is trying to create a workforce summit on the nursing shortage. But that same thing has to occur on the primary care shortage as well. And as I've testified in the past, we really have it wrong in the US. We we have um, twice as many specialists as we have primary care. The rest of the world has it the other way, and they're getting better results at a more affordable cost. Um, I'm not quite as optimistic as everyone else that just because you pass a bill that primary care practitioners are going to come here. And if you take a look at um, most of the uh, analysis that's been done, um, the most direct correlation to where they end up practicing is where they went to school and where they did their residency. And um, so I just hope that somebody doesn't forget the workforce piece as this moves along. As far as the two different versions, um, whichever version you pass, um, you're going to have to recognize a few things. Number one, that we're going to need the resources. And I know that Gene worked with Nolan and I think you already have that fiscal note. Do they have it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I posted it, but you just be fresh. I can pull it up okay. if you want. And timing, um, unlike other um, agencies of government or other businesses, the Green Mountain Care Board, probably the busiest time of the year is the summertime because we're dealing with hospital budgets and rates and everything else. And I'm not sure that. Um, the timing is the best as far as an October deadline. And um, so resources, timing, those are the big issues for us at the care board. We'll do whatever you tell us to do. Um, so we have not had a chance to review the fiscal note in the committee at this point, but can you comment on the resources? Just uh, as passed by the Senate, it simply says, 
resources as available for the Green Mountain Care Board to do its work. Uh, to, it's the intent of the General Assembly to provide sufficient resources. And we're getting mixed signals because some senators are saying, don't worry, we're going to make sure you have the resources. And others are saying, well, you could just do it. And so i got to tell you that well, as the administrator of the Green Mountain Care Board, I can't just do it. Okay, well, that's, that's part of the testimony that we need to hear. Okay. Because, of course, because everyone, you know, it's confusing, but, you know, we budget by constitution as the starting house, so we passed a budget. This was not yes. in front of the house as we created the budget. Uh, I guess my assumption is, and maybe a wrong assumption, that since the Senate has sent this bill to us, that their version of the budget as passed will include resources for the Green Mountain Care Board. But what I'm hearing you say is that there may be those in the Senate who believe that there are sufficient resources within the Green Mountain Care Board that it doesn't require an additional appropriation. So just as you saw that great divide over what this bill should even be in the Senate, there's that same divide about what resources would be necessary to do the work. So I just want to put that out there. Jean, um, do you want to talk about the spread? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So what we did was we worked with... You'll need, you'll need to talk closer to the mic, or it won't be recorded. Perhaps you could pull a chair up, or Dr. Richter, you could switch over just for the moment or something, swap chairs. Sure. And then Jean could pull a chair up closer to the microphone, because otherwise it does not get recorded. So for the record... For the record, Jean Stutter, business manager at the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, what we did in looking at costs was we, we broke it out um, from the Senate as passed by section because there's, you know, there's kind of clear delineation by section. Um, and um, the first... Do we have a document? Uh, you know, I, I did not bring, I'm sorry, I did not bring... Uh, well, I would appreciate if you'd forward the document to us so I we can actually review what you're... you're referring to. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, so thank you. No, I mean, go ahead. That, that's online right now. Uh, Lori said if you refresh it. No, I, I think and, that, and that, Nolan that, did work with Gene. That's but, Nolan's fiscal note. Yeah, that's right. Nolan's that's fiscal note. So, so I'm I asking will, for okay. G, a document from the Green Mountain Care Board. Yes, right, I, I, from the joint fiscal office. Yes, I apologize. So we'll make sure that you, okay. you have one. Okay. So, so. In, um, in working through this, um, section one from the Senate as passed uh, references a universal coverage for a primary care report. In that, um, that takes it through, um, the report takes it through and is, um, we estimate contrast expenses to be uh, about $110,000 for that. And again, I will, I will get you the note on that. Um, that specifically talks about the specific services that would be um, defined. And, um, and there were two previous UPC studies. And um, what we looked at the parts for the specific report, what we did was we looked at the parts that were different from the two previous studies. And so um, one difference was, um, if Vermont can achieve universal primary care through health insurance. And then we also looked at how to update a model that um, from Wakely that came from one of the existing reports to look at how to make coverage for primary care services affordable. And um, those together, we estimated would cost about $110,000 in contract services. And then also um, for FTE staff would be the equivalent of one to two FTEs working on that, which fully loaded um, would be roughly in the ballpark of 90,000 uh, person for working on that. So that's the first part to cover the report. And so that's 90K per person? Yes. And the range of one to two FTEs. And then moving forward and thinking about the um, draft operational plan, because it seems like there's a clear pivot point that, that section two, the universal um, coverage for primary care draft operational plan will only 
go into place if everyone agrees on section one. So I tried to pull them out discreetly. Um, the, the biggest lift on the operational plan part is determining if it is a feasible and that the benefits to Vermont residents outweigh the estimated financial costs. So, um, so that's putting together the operational plan. We estimated about $300,000 for a contract expense for that draft operational plan. And then the subsequent work is that there's going to be the draft operational plan that goes to HROC um, in October of 19, and then in January of 20, it would be the final draft to your committee, House Appropriations, Senate Appropriations, Senate Health and Welfare, and Senate Finance. So for that, um, we also included one to two FTE, and the tricky part with timing is the, the contracts are discrete, you know, in terms of discrete number. Um, when it gets to uh, staffing requirements, because it's spreading over like a longer period, then um, assuming that someone would be needed to help support and answer questions about the operational plan throughout the legislative session, um, we included another one to two FTE there. So, um, so the total cost range would be, if you observe on the, the total cost range would be contracts and FTEs in the range of about five hundred ninety thousand to about seven hundred and seventy thousand total. If you assume the full contract cost plus the FTE range as our estimate right now, for the, and it, for the entirety of the for the entirety two section one and over, section two phased over two fiscal years. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Again, I want to be clear with the assumption that um, even though the report is due in January of 20, 2020, that our assumption was that there would be Green Mountain Care Board staff needed to respond to questions throughout the legislative session and um, work on that. Okay. So what I'm taking from your testimony, from Kevin's testimony, is that number one, resources would be required yes. that there's not sufficient resource within the current funding of the Green Mountain Care Board, either for staffing or consultants to mm -hmm. do the report yes. or to do the work necessary. Yes. So, and that the range okay. is over two fiscal years. Yeah. And in this fiscal year, the range is um, a little used here, I think, in the order of a range of 170. I'm looking at Nolan's note sure. as well, $172,006,000 in fiscal year, in, in state dollars, right? Okay. And that assumes that there would be matching dollars. That assumes using bill back. Using bill back. Right. So, um, if I may, I have two okay. additional thoughts on that when you're ready. Uh, can I just? Go ahead. I sent your email, Jean, to mm -hmm. Lori. Okay. Posting it. Okay. So it should be up. The thing that you're looking at, that's I'm posting it now. It'll take a minute or two, and then refresh, and I may have to be something. Okay. Um, so the one thing I want to make crystal clear is that we can't take our focus off the implementation of the all payer model, and so that the resources have to be there. And I do want to say that um, I did disagree with one of the earlier witnesses that it is possible for capitation to play a role in this and that um, if you take a look at what's being done in the all payer model they are putting more resources to primary care um, and uh, they're trying to make administration sim simplification occur so they're making changes to prior op and things like that and um, so it, it can occur in a capitation model as well okay. it doesn't have to be fee for service so what I'd like to suggest, just in terms of our time and our process, is that we take your memo, what you, the, the numbers, and, and Nolan's fiscal note, and not try to dive into that in any specific detail right now. I think, okay. I think the, we, we will be able to come back to that. Okay. What I'm wanting to do is to kind of do the, get a broad understanding of the 
represent the care board's needs and their perspective. And number one, you're testifying. Additional resources would be necessary Absolutely. Under, under as passed by the Senate. And uh, more resources under the as passed by the Senate than the Senate Health and Welfare version. Well, that's, that's what I wanted to get to then as well as right. what your views are on the resources or work of the, the involvement of the Greenbelt Care Board in as passed by Senate Health and Welfare. So to be clear, the Greenbelt Care Board hasn't taken a position I understand either that. version. I doubt that you will. Right, and we wouldn't. No, I understand that. Right. Um, so, but have you? But as far as our workload, it's definitely heavier under the second version. And is is there a, an estimate of need in terms of as passed by the Senate Health and Welfare Committee? Did you ever? I, I would. Susie Barrett, Executive Director, Greenmount Care Board, as passed by uh, the Senate Health and Welfare. There would not be. Uh, Fiscal need. There was a stakeholder group that right. we could. Okay. Well, that's what, I just said. So what I'm trying to establish right. is that, okay, so under the Senate Health, because we're, we're right. what we really have here today, are, in part, is that we have in front of us the bill is passed by the Senate, and that's what you're testifying to in terms of there is a need for resources, and, and you've given us an estimate of the range of resources, and our Joint Fiscal Office has given us fiscal need. Those resources would be essential according to your testimony in order to implement as passed by the Senate. Correct. In, as, in the, we've had numbers of witnesses today and many communications saying, please reinstate the language of the Senate Health and Welfare Bill. I understand you're not taking a position on that, but my hope is to try to establish what would be needed in terms of resources for the Green Mountain Care Board in that version and what I'm hearing from Susan Barrett as the executive director is that the testimony was that there would not need to be additional resources we could absorb that work in, in the Senate health and welfare version of the bill okay so that's 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 helpful and surprising to me it seems like a fairly intense process over the next nine months to establish a platform off of which universal primary care could go forward. And so that's that's good news. Yeah. To clarify, I understood the first Senate Health and Welfare Bill to be for our responsibilities was to just to be to bring in the stakeholders and talk it was by state and the ACO and utilize their expertise to provide input on how to go forward. But in my opinion, in assessing both of these bills, the second bill, the appropriations bill, was a much heavier lift. And, and we should make this very clear. And if we're not on the same page, we should, we should um, clarify that. So. Well, this, is the, this is the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so. <laughs> the, the, health, the Senate Health and Welfare version put much more of a burden on AHS. Right. Yeah. And on the ECO. Yep. Right. No, I understand. There's a there's a significant difference in role and responsibility. And the second version of as passed by the Senate moved a lot of responsibilities right. to the Greenback Care Board. So I would like to ask Kevin, as the chair of the Greenback Care Board, to comment on something that has come up. And I frankly, I think a, a question that has kind of just lingered for me or for some others in the in the debate and discussion around this. We are currently in the midst of a major effort with the accountable care organization model, the all-payer model, one care is the uh, ACO at this point. And the question, a comment was made earlier by one of the previous witnesses that there did not appear to be any conflict between m continuing to move forward with the all-payer model implementation and initiating implementation of a universal primary care or possibly universal publicly funded unit primary care either that the two do not are not in conflict with each other and that they could both both initiatives could move forward simultaneously and I'm interested from the Greenmount Care Board's vantage point what how you see that in terms of 
trying to move several initiatives forward simultaneously, uh, or whether there's to just give me a sense so, of so that, my, those my concern would there. be that if um, people have this um, hope that in a few short years there's going to be this great new system that is going to uh, compensate them much better than um, how they're working today, that they may not um, be as willing to join in, in an ACO, and that there may be some stickiness to that. Um, I don't think that there's a true conflict between the two, but I do think that there could be complications. So I wonder if we could delve into that a little bit more um, in terms of uh, potential conflict or not. Um, and I'm specifically looking at whatever the future um, financial modeling, how the dollars would flow between what the effort is with the um, all-payer model and the ACO and what might be, and it's not defined yet, but what might be the dollar flow for uh, universal primary care. So I think one of the things that you can look to is just look to uh, the current experience that we're seeing in that, um, for example, an area where I live, Rutland, is not participating in um, the ACO because the FQHC um, has the vast, vast majority of primary care practitioners. And because they are able to get better um, compensation in that model than they could if they were in private practice, um, they really have put the roadblocks on that whole county um, joining the ACL. And um, so no matter what it is, there's always going to be what's in it for me, what's best for me. Um, just human nature, and so there could be that problem. Okay, that, I mean, that's helpful background. It's not quite what I was trying to get at, and maybe I can't at this point articulate it well enough yet. But I'm, uh, I'm not thinking about participation as much as, you know, wh wh where is the money coming in from, and how is it being distributed? Does that get much more complicated, or can that um, it would all depend on how the universal primary care system was designed, and, and that's the unknown, and so it's pretty hard to hypothesize on it. Okay. So can I just bookmark that issue, the, the relationship of the implement, continuing implementation of the ACO and potential implementation of universal primary care as something which I would, have, I would ask and welcome you and others at the Green Mountain Care Board to be thinking about and perhaps offering us some more specific comment, if that's possible, even as we move forward with our deliberations over the next well, period, of, period of days. Because I think, I think there, the, the, there, is, there is... The design of the whole system is really the key. And if you take a look at it, first of all, you have to define what primary care is. I think Millbank could help with that. Um, but then when you start to get into it, like when I go see my doctor, he's one of the few doctors that will still draw blood out of you. And is that covered? And things like that. So it, it just gets complicated as you start to figure out, you know, what is, what isn't. And uh, those are things that are going to have to be figured out. And that's why it's, it's going to take resources to do that. I, I think what, what would be helpful for me is, is if there was some ability to say, um, well, if the, if the basic model were this, for instance, if the basic model were as past Senate Health and Welfare and the money was going into a fund and so forth, versus if the basic model was, um, you know, supporting, I, I can't even find it, but, but the uh, bill as passed the Senate had the possibility of different models. And it, and it may not be possible even, but, um, as you were saying, without knowing how the system was set up, you can't really compare. But I'm just wondering if, if you said, well, hypothetically, if it was sort of this way versus this way, um, it might be easier to for those to both work together financially 
before it might be more difficult. Um, it's possible, but to the extent that Green Mountain Care Board members could chew on that a little bit to help guide us within the next couple of days, it would be really helpful. <laughs> well, we're just we have, we have our own time frame, as you well know. So, um, well, at least you invited us in to testify. We did I'm glad you're here. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to lay on the table one of the questions that I had, and I'll just name it for myself, that this is not making a judgment about the value of universal access to primary care, or even the value of universal access for publicly funded primary care. But the state of Vermont has made a decision to commit to a systems change with the accountable care organization, the all-payer model. And we are being asked to add to that an additional <coughs> significant change in the healthcare system of Vermont for implementing, moving toward implementing some version of universal primary care. The question is, is whether publicly financed or not publicly financed, but the Senate bill and the Senate Health and Welfare bill both at least aim in the direction of universal access to primary care. And I have to honestly say there is, while even if you share that goal, there is the question of how much systems change can be managed at the same time. You know, that's and, a, a and, that, and I'm not that, talking about specific yep. dollars. I'm not talking about, yep. I'm just talking globally when you're trying to move a system in a new direction, how much systems change can be implemented and absorbed at the same time. I'm going to be very clear. I'm not saying that's my concern and I'm opposed to this. I think there I needs think to be acknowledgement, acknowledgement of that issue and has so, a challenge. you know, we just have to look at what transpired in, since the passage of Act 48 to, to see that um, really you have to focus on a couple of things at a time and you can't take on the whole world. And I, when people ask me why did Act 48 fail, I say because we tried to do too much being pushed by the Federal Affordable Care Act in the exchange and because we weren't ready to actually do the exchange properly, that then we, we lost the faith of the citizenry for government to do anything right. And, um, you know, so I worry about that, that, you know, we should actually get some things done right and then progressively move uh, towards a better system rather than trying to take on too much at a time. Now, I'm not saying that this is too much at a time, but I'm just saying it's a real concern. It needs to be thought about. Yeah. Betsy and then Brian. So I, I have a question for you around monies and everything. When Dr. Mm -hmm. Ramsey and Dr. Fine talked about the 1% increase to primary care, were you in the room when that no. was being discussed? They thought that by increasing... This is in Rhode Island. In yeah. Rhode Island. I'm sorry, Dr. Fine is from Rhode Island and Dr. Allen Ramsey is part of us. I know Dr. Oh, Allen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> Just a little too. Um, but they both were indicating that in Rhode Island, when um, they increased the spend towards primary care mm -hmm. for the entire state, they had an 18 percent, 18 percent um, decreasing costs just by doing that. And that doing a couple of things. It was, it was, it was one not just one percent per year over a period of oh, yeah, years. Over, no, it wasn't five just years? one year. Five years. Yeah, one percent yeah. isn't going to cut it. Yeah, okay. it was over four or five years. Over four or five years, they saw a fairly decent decrease in costs by doing that. Do you see Vermont being able to do something about whether it's one percent or increasing to two percent towards the cost <coughs> and how that would play out? Well, I think that um, the fact that what we've approved in the ACO budget um, does pay a little bit more and does try to decrease um, administrative simplification is a clear indication that yes, we at the Rebound Care Board and yes, the people at um, One Care Vermont, our ACO, believe that it is important to 
funnel more resources to primary care because it's going to be a better investment in the system. And we in state government have tried to do it over the years. I mean, this isn't something new. I mean, when we've done increases in Medicaid reimbursement, we've tried to target that towards primary care. Um, So, I hear I hear that there's concern about taking on too much at once, and how um, we've made a commitment to go in a certain direction, and that layering too many things at once might be a burden. That it seems like too often in our civilization, we're we're focused on like sort of immediate short-term fixes to problems, and we lose sight of a long-term vision or goals. So I am curious how might universal primary care be integrated into existing health care reform efforts? How, how might we frame it as a, being coordinated and an expansion upon that versus, some, versus something extra? Because you mentioned earlier, remember you went like this, and you were like, yep. they're not incompatible. Or they're, and so I'm curious if you could say more how you might see this being integrated into what's going on instead of being just something extra so again, um, I would hope that if universal primary care was implemented, that it would be done in such a way that it would be compatible with our move towards population health. And um, that would be what I would see the two of them working together. Um, if, it, if it's not done in that way, then we're going to have something going to fail. We're not going to reach our scale targets with the federal government on that agreement if, if it's not done in a complementary way. Okay. Back in 1980s, when we um, uh, we had a whole thing at the, at um, at that time in CHV before it became FAHC. Um, they had a big push saying that everything was going to go towards the primary care. It was going to be all outpatient services and hospitals were going to decrease in size. And we realized that didn't really happen. And um, it's somewhat just the reverse of that that's happened. We've lost a lot of primary care. Exactly. And we've gotten more into the hospital. But by having the focus go back to primary care, we would be taking mon more monies from the hospital because we're trying to make it so that people wouldn't have to go into the hospital. We're trying to treat them at the at the service in their own backyard, basically. Yeah, backyard, so a number of hospitals are already committed to trying to shift resources away. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at the leadership that Dr. Brumstead has been exhibiting on the all-payer model, um, there's an acknowledgment that the, the right way to do things is to treat patients in the proper setting. And you, the hope is that they don't have to actually get into a hospital setting. So I, I think the hospitals are willing to, to work on this um, collaboratively. Um, and the fact that so many primary care practices are now owned by hospitals, um, you know, they're going to they're gonna have skin in the game no matter how it, it plays out. Do you think by increasing the amount that they're providing to the primary care provider of the piece of the pie that they are right now, increasing that would help? Well, when you push on one side of the bubble, the, the balloon, the other side's going to pop out, and there, there, will, there will be pressures. But if it's done right, and again, it's all in the implementation. If it's done right, and the dollars that are invested in primary care reduce the dollars that are spent elsewhere in the system, then it'll work. But there's no guarantees. What's well, a goal? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And Thank you. Susan and others. I'm going to uh, ask to hear from Michael Costa from uh, Diva next. Chairman Committee, Michael Costa, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Vermont Health Access. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify on S53. I just want to raise a couple points from the administration's perspective on this bill. 
And, and, and as we've done throughout our testimony this morning, there have been references to both S-53 as passed by the Senate as well as S-53 as passed by the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. So I hope you'll, to the degree possible, comment on that. I think we're going to, uh, my plan, if it's helpful to the committee, is to start with the overall um, concept. I know that the administration testified at length in the Senate Health and Welfare about its point of view on the concept of universal primary care. That's uh, I want to tie right into that with some of the really good questions that were coming out of the committee a minute ago. Um, certainly, th this is not about, let's we'll start with what it's not about, and then we'll get to what it's about. It's not about whether it's a good idea to invest in primary care. I think there's broad agreement that investing in primary care and having the delivery system be more coordinated is a good thing. I think the state's efforts around healthcare generally and with the ACO program specifically are an acknowledgement that primary care is central to our hypothesis about how reform is supposed to work. Uh, so it's not really about what, it's about how. And what I think I heard the committee talking about a second ago is that you have both a policy issue and an operational issue. In my mind, the policy issue, going back to some testimony I did earlier this year, is what problem are you trying to solve? And from the administration's point of view, I read the documents and agreements that the state has signed with the federal government, both its 1115 Medicaid waiver and its all-payer model ACO agreement, is that the problem we're trying to solve is that we pay too much for health care and we do not have high-quality, well-coordinated care. And so we're trying to integrate the health care system and community service system to deliver better quality care at a more reasonable price. The problem we're not trying to solve is getting to the last mile of insurance co coverage or changing who pays into the system. Because my own personal hypothesis, uh, delivered with some experience in creating a universal publicly financed healthcare system, is that until you get the cost of care under control, it is very hard to move dollars into a publicly financed system. Because to the extent the expense of that system grows more rapidly than your tax base, you're going to have a real sustainability problem. Separately, beyond the policy issue, there's a pure operational issue. Simply, how much statewide change can you reasonably manage at any one given time? For me, I, I worry about a lack of alignment between universal primary care and the other statewide healthcare reform that we're presently engaged in. Uh, I think we're on a clear path with the ACO model. Uh, as always, I say the same thing. I promise to work hard on the ACL model. Uh, the administration promises to be transparent on the ACL model. I do not know if it will succeed. We're engaged in a multi-year effort to determine whether it has merit and whether it will succeed. And I think we'll know at some point in the future. Uh, I think universal primary care is a totally different project uh, that is, has a non-trivial amount of complexity. And so I think to, to take on a totally separate second statewide reform effort will put both projects at risk or uncertain benefit. And I say that not as just an opinion, but as someone who has put time in as both a contributor and a reader of the two separate reports on universal primary care that have been delivered to this legislature. Uh, the two separate reports were on 181 pages total, uh, and they list lots of excellent questions that to my mind have not yet been answered. Uh, specifically, the 2015 report on universal primary care uh, bucketed questions into five broad categories. What is the public financing plan? Uh, what's the economic impact of that financing plan? Uh, what are the legal and waiver challenges facing the state government implementing a plan? How do you operationalize that plan, including what I think are really vexing coordination of benefit issues? Um, because potentially you have every Vermonter with two insurance cards in their pocket, and insurers and providers would have to figure out how that would work. Um, and then how would this plan design work with health savings accounts? Which uh, the administration's view of uh, the law right now is that uh, ERISA, and uh, federal law make universal primary care and health savings accounts incompatible. I know other people have different opinions. <coughs> we don't think they work together. And I think we use it as an example of just how disruptive this could be to people's present insurance relationships. Lastly, um, just to make quite clear, a, a publicly financed plan requires uh, new taxes. I think the governor has been very clear on his position on new taxes and fees, and so it's hard to see a situation where the administration would ever support that aspect of universal primary care. Um, lastly, I, I, I commingled health savings accounts and ERISA together, and I did not intend to do that. Uh, health savings accounts are just a separate sort of legal problem, uh, where we don't believe you can have, if you have a health savings account, it means you doesn't have other types of insurance. And that we have examples of both this either being offered as an insurance plan, or just some sort of public good. 
Um, and for example, there's an example with the federal government, if you have TRICARE or veteran VA insurance or um, Native American insurance, the federal government does not permit you to have an HSA. So we're just worried about this disrupting that relationship. Finally, <coughs> like any publicly financed statewide health care effort that involves how people pay in and get coverage, um, there's the legal barrier of ERISA, which just basically says you can't, you can't compel employers to carve out primary care insurer, uh, services from their self-insured plans. So employers who continue to carry primary care coverage and the employees in those plans could end up paying twice um, or just really run into this coordination of benefits project. Um, and so like anything like this, you'd end up taxing some people and businesses for a plan that they don't want, they don't need because they're offering similar coverage. Um, I, I think each of those issues, sort of the big picture issues has huge layer of complexity underneath. The first two studies tried to get at those questions. I think it did a fair job of illuminating those questions, but it did not provide answers. And so to me, it's, you know, it's to, to have a third effort at this, either in the way the original Senate Health and Welfare Bill imagined or in the as past version imagines, is really a third bite of the apple with very few of the questions actually answered. And so for me, that brings me all the way back to the operational issue. How much reform can you responsibly manage? Uh, and part of the reason why the administration opposed both the concept and the bill in the Senate was that um, we think the concept is fairly fraught and on an operational issue it's just not clear how we can do both and both while running the Medicaid program while doing complex IT projects with the state has historically struggled with like integrated eligibility in our MMIS system and it's just really hard to see how these things would work together so um, <coughs> with that I'd be happy to answer the committee's questions I would just say that from a policy operational conceptual uh, issue, uh, or from a policy and operational perspective, uh, the administration just does not support um, effort to go forward with universal primary care as a major healthcare reform initiative. <coughs> Though it in no way diminishes <coughs> our support for primary care as part of healthcare reform. Can I ask for one clarification then we'll take some questions? Um, <clears throat> that, to just be clear, that the administration position is not based solely on a proposal for universal publicly financed primary care. What I hear you saying is that your the administration's position at this point in time is to not initiate uh, further study uh, analysis or to develop any operational plan for the implementation of universal primary care, whether publicly financed or financed in another manner. Yes, but I want to highlight the phrase you used at this present point in time. I have not seen language that I could see us supporting. It doesn't mean that someone couldn't come up with an idea that might be interesting. But I have not, in any of the discussions over the past two years on universal primary care in the legislature, um, seen anything that the administration could support, and we're really focused on the present agreements we have with the federal government. So okay. it's, to answer your question directly, yes, it's, it's, it's opposition of both the concept and, and the language. Well, but I'm, I'm trying to, I, I really do want to make sure I understand, everyone yep. understands, it's not just the concept of universal primary care, but... But further exploration of it as well. Of further exploration of it at this time, whether or not that operationally includes public finance. That adds another layer of opposition from what I'm hearing your testimony, that, that, that the complexity. Okay, I, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, because I see where you're going. I, what I want to be really careful about, and I'm not trying to be too cute by half, is we support the goal, of the administration supports the goal of everybody having health insurance. And I think the administration's position on the individual mandate bill that came through this committee shows our support for the concept of having everybody having coverage. Um, and so nothing about this bill changes that support. However, um, you know, when we go between what and how, uh, we're, we're not supportive of universal primary care as the mechanism to ensure that universal coverage, that we are open for other discussion of other uh, avenues that might get us to universal coverage. And again, without trying to just reiterate that, that that position is not based on the possibility that it might be publicly financed. 
Yes. But it's broader than that. Yes. There's a, another layer of concern or opposition, I would say, about the public financing <coughs> proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, but but your opposition, putting that you're, you're putting yeah. that aside. The administration is taking a position at this point in time yeah. that to try to undertake a further study or implementation of universal primary care, regardless of the financing. I, I appreciate your question, and it helps me to clarify my comments, because I think there are, are three levels of concern and objection. There is obviously a public finance concern. The governor does not support new taxes, and this implies eventually new taxes. Okay. Separate from them, there is a policy objection. Right, that we don't support universal primary care as a concept because we think there are other ways to focus our healthcare time and effort. Separate from that, there's an operational issue that further discussion of this um, takes limited resources and discussion and implementation of healthcare reform that we don't think is appropriate given the path the state's on. So thank, thank you for helping me separate those three. I'm just trying efforts. to make sure that we don't leave with a misunderstanding of where the concern and opposition is coming from. And again, let me just be clear, my clarified questions is not necessarily a reflection at all of any position that I share, but I think it's important for us to understand the yes. administration's position. Brian. So I have two qu questions. Um, one thing I want to start with is just thank you for being so clear about your opposition and giving us specific reasons, because we don't always get that from people who say they oppose things. Um, so at least it's, it's uh, for the record, you gave really clear reasons. Um, one of those reasons had to do with the concept of not wanting to raise new taxes. And I'm curious if you could help me understand what the difference is between raising someone's taxes to cover their health care um, and removing their cost subsidies or removing other public assistance, which, which ultimately increases a fee that a person's going to have to pay. Because we've been hearing, like, you know, no new fees, no new taxes, but then we're asked to make policy decisions that are going to increase the actual cost of people, which is increasing their fees. So, can you help me understand that discrepancy between the sort of the, the policy statement of no new taxes, no new fees, but then recommendations that actually cost people of Vermont more to access their health care? Mm -hmm. In um, this year's budget, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Yes, of course. I understand yeah. the question. And I'm going to, if I may, representative work from like the specific out to the general. Okay. Um, what, one of the problems with affordability that we worry about in any publicly financed health care system is sort of the end of employer-based tax subsidies. And once you make something tax-based instead of employer-based, you lose those tax subsidies and make them more, make it more expensive. And so that's beyond sort of the general administrative, um, it, general goal of the administration to avoid um, new taxes or fees. Particular to this bill, there there is sort of a tax argument embedded in it that by making some of the publicly financed, you're potentially making it more expensive because of the current tax treatment of healthcare. Now, working to the general, I, I certainly understand the tension in your argument, right? Which is because I, I hear you saying that let's have an argument about let's have a discussion rather because it's Vermont, not a different state, about affordability because you're saying hey, no new taxes and fees, with the argument being we want to keep Vermont affordable. Yet there are some policy decisions in the budget that have the potential to cost for monitors more money. And so um, for this one, we want to make sure that we're doing the best job that we can uh, on both sides of the fence. One, in what direct taxes and fees we levy, because they obviously cost for monitors money, and so that's part of the objection here. On the other side of the fence, I think as Commissioner Gusterson testified in our budget presentation, Diva's budget presentation, we are constantly reviewing what level of support we might offer our most vulnerable. And so I think with the Vermont premium assistance and cost sharing reductions, uh, our cost sharing reduction proposal rather, it's not that um, we didn't think that those folks could use help in paying for healthcare expenses, which are substantial. It's we're making the best of difficult alternatives given limited public funds. And so I think two things can be equally true. You want to try to keep tax and fee burdens low for people, but sometimes you have to make hard policy decisions about who can be the recipient of public funds when you have a whole more need than you have resources. Okay, can I ask my second question? Please. So I, I heard you say that it's a goal to have universal coverage. Mm -hmm. And I guess what my question is, what about everybody having the ability to use that coverage? Because we can, we can force people to purchase a product from a corporation that provides a service, but if people can't afford to use that service that they're being forced to purchase, then 
we're levying another fee by forcing them to purchase this thing that they can't even use, which then backfires and costs us money. So I'm kind of struggling with this concept of we want to provide universal coverage <coughs> and make things, but also make things more affordable and take care of the most vulnerable. Yeah. I, I think that's an outstanding question. And it all goes back to what problem are you trying to solve and in what order are you trying to solve them? Uh, and I think the administration's hypothesis, or at least my own, is that you will not be able to make sufficient progress on access and affordability and universal coverage in healthcare until ongoing regular healthcare costs are more in line with economic growth and wage growth. And so our point of view is let's take care of cost containment and quality first. If you get those things under control, then you can focus on affordability and access. Um, and that's, would you like to be able to do everything at the same time? Yes. I sat through the chairman's uh, testimony thinking, um, in a world of, um, you know, we live in a resource limited world. If we didn't, then it might be interesting to pursue several different avenues of statewide reform at the same time. But we live in a world of restrained time and resources, so we have to make strategic decisions about what goes first. And the administration's view is that payment and delivery system reform is the precondition for working on the types of issues that you've raised. So what if, um, may I ask one more? So what if, what if, um, I don't know what if is a good question to ask someone when they're with us, but I'm working on my question asking. So um, I actually have this thing here that's uh, this, this is not asking the right questions. <laughs> I can only tell you, Representative, that um, I, I never expect this to be easy. Okay. So, so, well, I'm just thinking what if so we invest years in this new philosophy or policy approach that's, that we believe we're going to, by, by reforming the way we pay providers and organize healthcare that we're going to reduce cost but we're do we're also we're not doing that in a vacuum there's also other policy decisions that are making healthcare less affordable for people so it's almost like we're creating the conditions to manufacture lower cost by denying people what they need and then if that's going to be used to justify a system change you asked what the problem is well i think the problem could be to, to reduce cost but I think the greater problem is how do we take care of the people? And I, I'm kind of struggling with how, why we can't be thinking about both at the same time. Why does it have to be either we reduce cost or we just, you know, spend all these limited public funds and raise taxes and milk people dry? I don't think it has to be either or. No, I, I think you're right. It's, it's both and, right? Because for us, if you look at our Medicaid, for DIVA and AHS, if you look at our Medicaid waiver, if you look at our kind of care organization agreement, if you look at our all uh, all payer model agreement with the federal government, there are access measures, right? If we are, if, if there's any indication that we're saving money by denying care, then the model doesn't work. And so, but it's about, we're having a conversation with universal primary care about what is your strategic direction and your strategic investment in statewide health care reform. And so you never want to do that at the expense of access. But you do have to, you know, you have a limited amount of time and resources to engage in statewide reform. And so I think we're merely saying that that focus should be on the all pair model. But there are safeguards in there because both Medicaid and the state legislature and CMS all care about access. And that's the thing where we're obviously looking for very clearly in any healthcare reform innovation. If you're saving money through reducing access, you're doing it wrong and it needs to stop. And so we have no indication of that. We feel like we have appropriate safeguards. Thanks. So, so using your words and saying that you're unsure whether or not the all pair model and the ACO model is going to work and be um, able to do what it says it's going to do, yep. don't you think that we should have something else we're working on in the meantime so that, should it fail, we have something to put in immediately to? Shore up the healthcare system so that we have that access to primary care immediately. And whether or not we phase it in as the all payer model, because I'm certainly we're not going to be able to do all this work this session, maybe we will, but if we can't, then we have time to do that phasing in. Mm -hmm. and getting this work done. I don't think we should drop this in any way, shape, or form. No, uh, let me, uh, thank you for the question, Representative, and, and I would say a few things. One, I try to be 
you know, much like you have sat in this committee and watched people make promises they can't keep. And so my number one goal is not, not to do that. So I try to be really honest with people about whether the ACO based reform is going to work or not. And the clear answer is I don't know. And when I talk about it to my own leadership in the administration, I say, look, we can mitigate risk, but we can't eliminate risk. And so if you're going to engage in any reform, there's going to be risk. So then that prompts a natural question, which is, OK, so what's plan B? And for me, the need for a plan B does not eliminate our strong viewpoint of what the problem is we're trying to solve. So if you believe the problem you're trying to solve is payment delivery system reform that makes quality higher and costs more sustainable, it, you know, our first plan is to try to use value-based payments through an ECO to get out of paying for volume and start paying for value. And my plan B is also value-based payments. And so I think if the ACO did not work, you'd be partnering, for example, with providers directly, like the hospital association, hospitals, and saying, hey, there are things that we need to work on a payment delivery system reform. Can we partner directly rather than using the ACO as an intermediary? And so I think for when you're talking, I, I still, if the ACO model does not achieve all its goals, until I receive sort of more evidence and data, I still think the problem we're trying to solve is payment delivery system reform. And you'd have to show me evidence and data, Representative Dunn, that says there's something about universal coverage generally and uh, universal primary care coverage specifically that makes me change my mind on what problem we're trying to solve before Plan B involved a universally publicly financed system of care. So I guess, I, I guess I'm going to ask you, would you agree? It doesn't sound like you would, but um, that access to the care is the primary thing in order to get that value you're looking for from the care to have that reform. So if they don't have access to the care, we, are, we might have value for 50% of Vermont because they're able to access the care, but the rest of Vermont doesn't have that value and is not getting the kind of care that we, at least myself, and I know other people on the committee want for all Vermont. That's my concern. Yes, payment reform is part of it, but I think that initially we need to ensure that all Vermonters mm. have access to care because that drives the care costs down in the long mm. run. And so I think that's the primary push that I would see. That's me. Thank you. That, it's helpful to hear that. I, I, a couple things I'm thinking about is uh, when I listen to your questions, is there a difference between access and coverage? Because they're not 100% the same thing. Um, and so I'd want to think more about that. Uh, obviously, I think people, the whole goal is to get Vermonters the care they need when they need it, and you know, to get the right thing at the right time. Um, so we don't disagree on that. I just, uh, you know, I try to work through the other side of the equation. If I could get, um, if the state government, it's not I by any means, uh, if state government could get 100% of Vermonters coverage today um, and access today, but those the delivery system quality is not higher and the costs are not controlled, then we have set up a situation where you either need to raise taxes annually or hollow out other programs to pay for it. And that's the trade-off that I, I don't think we're anxious to make. I think it's hard, this conversation is hard because Representative Dunn, I don't disagree with any of the goals any committee members have talked about. They're all valuable. It's about how you spend your time and focus. And I think, if I may, just to, and I think we'll need to wrap this up shortly, but I appreciate your allowing members to ask these questions. I think they're key. I think what I'm hearing from Representative Dunn in part, and I think part of the, the the case that is being made for universal primary care is that there's an ironic, uh, I'm not ironic, there's a, uh, you're saying we need to lower the costs and have payment reform before we pursue the other. And I hear the case being made that until and unless we get everyone access to primary care, we will not achieve the reduction in costs to the entirety of the system that in fact there's a missing there's a, there's a logic to your logic, but there's a missing piece that if in fact, and the, the compelling argument that's being put forward for universal primary care is that when implemented, universal primary care will in fact reduce by having both 
quality access to all Vermonters for primary care at no barrier. Mm -hmm. And then, in fact, we will up, we will move the intervention earlier for many, many Vermonters in their medical care. And that will result in the actual the entirety of the system reducing the demand for health care. Yes. And that, that and absent that, all the other health care reform uh, skips over the fact that there are people who may have insurance but can't access care or may have uh, may not have insurance and still are dependent on a system where they have to go to a free care or other things. And so I think that's that's what I hear is a, a compelling different scenario. Yes, but that brings us squarely back to the operational question. Because with the ACO-based system, I can test the return on investment of more investment in primary care today with the actual delivery system. To test the return on investment of universal primary care, I have to build an infrastructure. I have to create a publicly financed system. I have to give every Vermonter a card. I have to figure out well, what possibly benefits. Publicly financed or Possibly. You're, you're, you're so going can, to the one I that can you tell you oppose. <laughs> well, I can t I, regardless of how it's set up, it's a very fair point, Mr. Chairman, but regardless of how it's set up, I know I am in the midst of testing one of those now. And my hypothesis is that if uh, re boosting primary care and supporting primary care has that much quality return on investment and cash return on investment, I may can make an argument that we can take resources from the system today and cover that last mile of people that are uninsured or have trouble accessing care regardless if they have a, car, a card in their wallet. With universal primary care, we have to make a huge upfront investment to figure out how it works before testing that model. And so I think that's part of why the administration supports the former and is very concerned about the latter. That's a very fair point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your ability to be articulate in your position. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. So I think uh, let's hear from uh, two final witnesses for this morning and then uh, we'll be coming back to this clearly um, later. But uh, let's first hear from uh, Dan Barlow. Um, let me just say, I, I think in our, in our putting together our witness list, we've been trying to hear from both advocates for and those who may have positions of concern. So it's, it's a mix of, and we'll hear from the hospital association next, and then we'll finish for the morning. I do have a few printed copies of my testimony. OK. Has it been posted? Is it some, it's also yes, posted? Yes, okay. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Dan Barlow. I'm the public policy manager with Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. Um, I would like to initially start off talking a little bit about BBSR's history with healthcare because I think that informs our support for universal primary care. Uh, and it really ties in uh, our concerns that the employer based. Oh, thank you. That's going to be a lot easier. Uh, our employer-based healthcare system uh, is failing um, both employers and those who get their healthcare through uh, that. So VBSR is a statewide business organization. We've been around since 1990. We have 650 members across the state. Our businesses adhere to what we call the triple bottom line approach to business. That's people, planet, and prosperity. They often find that when they're, uh, they, uh, they're good stewards of the environment and they take care of their workforce, that makes them a more successful business. Um, and healthcare reform was actually the first uh, policy paper that BBSR put together in the early 1990s. I cannot claim to be part of that because I was in middle school at the time. Um, but um, that document, although it's been revised over the years, the values in that document continue to inform BBSR's policies around healthcare. And um, you know, our stool, our value stool around healthcare kind of has four legs. Uh, first, we, we want a system that covers everyone. You know, no one, no one's out. So all, all Vermonters or all, uh, you know, uh, residents of the United States, if we're talking about a national system, would have health care. Uh, we think we need to cut the unnecessary waste and spending from our system. Uh, we think we have to cut the tie between a person's health insurance and their job. 
uh, and we think we have to fund this system fairly, sustainably, possibly through taxation if that's uh, one of the only options that works. Um, so, you know, I want to go back to talking about cutting that tie between <coughs> insurance and the job. I think a lot of people realize that we have this sort of Frankenstein healthcare system that's been designed and built onto itself over the years. Uh, and the employer sponsored health insurance system, you know, really dates back to uh, uh, the Second World War. And that there are government uh, um, uh, controls over uh, how, how you compensate employees. So employers were looking for non wage ways to, to uh, attract employees. And health insurance became a big part of that. And I think a lot of us view, you know, when we ask what, what's a good job? You know, health insurance, employer-sponsored health insurance is an essential part of what we also consider a good job. Uh, over the years for uh, VBSR businesses, uh, it, we quickly realized that the cost of this system is unsustainable, and it's holding back economic development in Vermont. Uh, and the example I often like to use is Don Mayer, who owns Small Dog Electronics, uh, one of the VBSR founders. When he started in business, uh, 25 years ago, he could insure an employee and their whole family for $1,500 a year. And today that cost to him is $15,000. That's and cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it yeah. is. Yeah, $15,000 yeah. yeah. is pretty good. Oh, that, and that's why it's no longer just the family, you know. So uh, he's had to reduce his own coverage over the years. Um, and so he's paying about $7 an hour minimum wage for, an, for each employee just for health care. Um, and this, you know, impacts this every decision he makes from how much he offers as a wage uh, to uh, if he expands his business, hires more employees, expands benefits. So this is really weighing down on him. And it's interesting, Don's also someone who's also a big supporter of raising the minimum wage. And he's, you know, kind of struggling with how he can raise the minimum, his own minimum wage over the next few years because he thinks that's important and the burden of the health care costs that are weighing down on him as a business leader. Um, so, it, you know, and, and I have, you know, hundreds of stories just like Don from VBSR memberships. They're struggling with this, this you know, the, the sense that the employer-sponsored health insurance system is kind of a, a, a ball and chain on the ankle of, of them as business leaders right now. Um, so, uh, other drawbacks of the employer-sponsored health insurance system is that it limits business entrepreneurship. Uh, and mobility between jobs. Uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, people are not going to gamble with their health, uh, with their own health, uh, if they want to uh, become the next Ben and Jerry's and uh, you know form a new company. Um, it also has high administrative costs for businesses providing the benefit. You have business after business duplicating their efforts to administer this benefit to their own employees. Uh, and the system we have still large segments of the population remain uncovered. Uh, additionally, you know, um, it, it's uh, you know, for whether or not you have health insurance, it's kind of haphazard. Maybe you get it through your employment. Maybe you get it through a spouse's employment. Uh, maybe you're on you know a public benefit system, um, and so it creates a system where the businesses that are paying for employee health insurance are at a competitive disadvantage in the market because they know they're competing against other businesses that are not offering that benefit to their employees, and maybe their employees are on a state system, so we're all supporting them with our tax dollars in some ways. Can uh, I, so, can I yeah. just ask if you are open to taking questions along the way, or if you would ask that question, so um, whatever the committee prefers. So well, we're trying to get a sense of what works for you. Um, I'd be happy to take questions now. So. Ben, you have a question? I just have a question about um, I totally agree that we should be de decoupling health insurance from jobs. Yeah. Um, just makes sense as we move to the gig economy. Um, that being said, I don't see how this how universal primary care does that mm -hmm. because it's only a small piece of the larger. <coughs> so, how how do you envision that split happening when theoretically you would still have a lot of the major medical uh, benefits that what there's no current vehicle yeah. um, to decouple. Yeah, um, so I think maybe, uh, Chairman, I should have said, let's save questions for the end of my testimony. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. You can hold that question and finish your yeah. presentation. Yes, OK, okay. I, well, I really so appreciate it. Yeah. Um, but we do want to get to the end of the presentation so that 
his question get answered and that we have one more witness. I will make it uh, a very swift here. Um, additionally, we have fewer and fewer people covered through uh, health insurance through their job today. Uh, I dug up some recent numbers. I was looking for more recent numbers, and I couldn't find them. Back in 2012, there were about 307,000 Vermonters who got health insurance through their job. Uh, today, it's estimated it's about 285,000. So, you know, like everything, you know, very few things just kind of fall apart in one day. Uh, this is the slow drip of the system falling away. It's not a bridge that will collapse. Um, but it's a bridge that has pieces falling off every day. Um, so, you know, VPSR was a big supporter of, um, uh, you know, the uh, of single payer health care under the previous governor. Um, my members were pretty disappointed that, um, you know, for many reasons that ran into several, several walls. Although we do really appreciate the work of this committee, the Senate committee, and the legislature as a whole around this area. And, you know, I think one of the things that, uh, and this is reflected in testimony today, uh, one of the learned lessons here was that um, it, it's, it's difficult to do system-wide reforms in one big chunk. Uh, and that was, you know, one of the, the reasons, and in addition to many other reasons, that that effort uh, did fall apart. So uh, uh, to your point, Representative, uh, you're right, the universal primary kill care bill will not cut that tie between an, employment, uh, an employee and uh, their job with the health insurance. What it will do is put us on the path to a system that we hope will do that. We think this is the manageable first chunk to larger system-wide uh, reforms. Um, so we think that this is the path to uh, larger health care reform. If we can show that this is successful, that this investment in primary care can not only cover everyone, but also reduce, reduce costs long term, um, you know, that would be the path forward that we would choose. Um, you know, so this is a manageable piece of the health care system to, fo to focus on. We know that access to primary care is the foundation of every successful health care system across the world. Uh, and what also actually gets us excited about this is this would provide a benefit to every Vermonter, or almost every Vermonter, depending on how it's uh, formed. A lot of the times around health care actions in the legislature, you know, go after that declining, that smaller and smaller pool of people who don't have health insurance. Uh, and we like the idea of pushing forward a proposal that every Vermonter can benefit from. Uh, so that gets us really excited as well. Um, so we do see this as the first step towards larger system care. And, um, you know, I know the chairman will ask, you know, uh, about uh, which bill we prefer, the initial Senate health and welfare one or the bill that passed the Senate. We did prefer the original committee bill. Um, and uh, felt that that more firmly puts us on the path to universal health care, brings all the necessary stakeholders to the table, relies on their expertise, um, and uh, the bill that passed the Senate, we you know, appreciate that effort, but we found that a little lackluster. So, so I have a question to follow up the first event and a question. Well, I guess your question has yep. been addressed in the course of what you shared. Okay, Anne Marie? Do you think this is feasible on, on statewide level as opposed to a national level? I mean, we're a small state or a wealthy state? I appreciate that question. And when we talk about that, uh, in, in my policy committee with my members, that comes up all the time. Um, you know, quite frankly, uh, it's clear we have no leadership on this issue in Washington, D.C. right now. In fact, everything that they're doing seems to be taking health care backwards. Um, so we feel that, uh, you know, Vermont has been a successful leader in many areas. And that's why we think this deserves further study before we move forward, before we pull a trigger on something. So the chair does want to ask you uh, more about your interest in the two versions. Uh, yes. You were disappointed and uh, with what happened. You know, with the words in your mouth, I believe you, you indicated that you were more supportive, or you were supportive of the Senate Health and Welfare version. Um, let me put a point on it. If, in fact, all that could move forward in this session was the past, has passed the Senate version, what is the, what is your membership's position on that? Uh, you know, uh, I'm not would... suggesting that's the only choice, but I, but I do think it's important for us to have a sense of uh, how other people are viewing the choices, which, in fact, we do need to make. Is that worse than doing nothing? Yeah. Um, not some, we've heard different versions. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's worse than doing nothing, but it's it's not a, a present I can bring home to my members at the end of the session that they'd be very excited about opening up. So, 
Um, it, it's better than nothing, but we were really optimistic about this, the Senate committee version of the bill. Okay. And I, I, I appreciate your, your sharing that point, yeah. uh, or articulating that point of view. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Yeah. Um, so you have 650 members, is that businesses? Uh, a handful of nonprofits are members, and uh, we have a handful of just individuals who like the organization, and they'll they'll join. But the vast majority are businesses. And so, what is the um, total number of actual consumers who are people who are connected through their business to? You know what I mean? Like, how many employees? Um, last I checked, uh, our businesses employ about 5% of the workforce in Vermont. And, so, and we have businesses uh, in every part of the state and everything from you know, large corporations like Ben & Jerry's owned by a multinational cor out of, you know, country co a corporation all the way down to people who have you know, no employees and they're making value-added food products in their kitchen. So. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's uh, turn to... Devin, so Devin Green from the Vermont uh, State Hospitals and Health Systems. I like going by the one name thing. It's like Madonna. <laughs> Devin. Okay, we, will, we will try our best. To, uh, to use the right tone. Um, Devin Green, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for having me come in today to uh, talk about the Universal Primary Care Bill. Um, before I go into that, I did want to step back and just provide a little bit more detail about what's going on with the all-payer model effort um, and how it coincides with what's happening under or what's proposed under Universal Primary Care. Um, I just want to emphasize that this is a huge culture shift um, for the provider community. Is this now referring to? The all-payer model okay, in the ACF. Sure. Um, it, this is, what I'm trying to say is this is huge healthcare reform that's happening. It's not flashy, you don't get a card necessarily. Um, it, a lot of it is happening behind the scenes and it's how it should be because it's between your provider and yourself and it's more changing the culture and making a healthier culture. Um, we want it to uh, sort of be a natural progression and, um, and for people to not feel a jarring change, but that being said, it is a big undertaking um, and it requires engagement at the provider the provider patient, the community hospital, and at the regional level. So um, developing relationships at all levels um, to make that culture shape change, and that takes a lot of resources. Um, hospitals are doing this work already. Uh, Northwestern Medical Center is doing Rise Vermont and engaging its um, community to battle childhood obesity. Um, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital is working with its community and its community providers to find innovative ways to deal with the mental health crisis. And uh, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center is doing community development to help bring jobs to the community and um, sort of get at those social determinants of health issues. So this shift is already underway um, and it is massive but most importantly what's happening under all of this is um, an emphasis on primary care so in 2018 uh, hospitals through the ACO are investing 14 million dollars in primary care uh, that includes the blueprint community health teams with which Dr. Fine said was hugely important important for um, providing primary care for people. It includes um, that PMPM uh, payment to primary care providers and other incentives. Yes, so, so there is this shift towards supporting primary care and, and hospitals are doing the bulk of that through the ACO. Um, they're providing that funding. Um, so when we look at universal primary care to what Representative Tino was asking, Michael Costa, you know, or I forget who you're asking, but like where does this coincide? 
Um, I would say uh, use a scalpel, not an axe. So um, the whole point of the all pair model is to get it, people come in through their primary care provider. So we want as many people um, in having a primary care provider as possible. We want that incentive. So what you could do is you know, look at who is not able to have access and, and incentivize those folks or put a system in place to help those folks reach their primary care provider. Um, instead of developing a whole new system which could put strain on the current healthcare reform that's already happening. Um, I think there is, I think the um, strained resources issue is real. I think the people who would be working on universal primary care, at least under the um, original Senate Health and Welfare Bill, would be the ACO and FQHCs. Um, and so those are people who are also trying to implement the all care model at this time as well. Um, so I think that will cause a strain on the current healthcare reform effort, but I think one thing that they'll already be doing is trying to get people into primary care and trying to target people who don't currently have access to primary care. And once you have um, that data, you know, if you have um, proposals and uh, systems in place to get people into primary care and get them access, the ones who currently don't have it, um, that's when you can sort of mine the data to show the cost effectiveness and um, put it out on a broader scale sometime down the road. Um, the other thing that uh, I think was mentioned is that, uh, well one other thing that I, I wanted to say in terms of all this healthcare reform is that the other side of the all-payer model is um, the Green Mountain Care Board and um, limiting budgets and, and the oversight of hospital budgets. So right now hospitals are funding the reform effort under the all-payer model. At the same time, the Green Mountain Care Board is looking at their budgets and saying, reduce your budgets, reduce your budgets. So they are in this um, place of having to both invest for transformation and also um, reduce their spending. So um, they are going forward with that. They think this is the right thing to do for healthcare in Vermont to move from services to um, actual health for Vermonters because it's the best thing to do with Vermonters, but it does create a tension and a difficulty um, and setting up some whole new reform process sort of sends the message of, yeah, we're not really we're not really invested in what you're doing over here. We're going to do this new thing over here with universal primary care. Um, so again, it would just be helpful to have those things aligned. Um, and the other thing that came up earlier, I believe, by Dr. Deb Richter was um, the potential to use excess hospital revenue for as a funding mechanism for going further down the road on universal primary care. Um, I do see a couple issues with that that I spoke about in Senate Health and Welfare. One is that you're essentially betting against health care reform. So you're saying either hospitals don't come in on budget um, so you can fund something or you say they come in budget or and universal primary care is not getting funded. So it creates this weird sort of um, incentives um, when it comes to funding healthcare reform through a, fun a healthcare reform process. Um, there are legal issues with it as well in terms of um, the way it was set up in Senate Health and Welfare was that the Green Mountain Care Board could decide the amount that would be um, use that that could be seen as a tax um, which raises non-delegation issues because the legislature would be leaving it to the Green Mountain Care Board to essentially impose a tax on a hospital. Um, there's an issue around it being a provider tax so um, you're taxing hospitals uh, it would look like a provider tax we already have this sort of six percent presumptive cap that that would go on top of and then in addition um, there's an issue because provider tax must be 
done uniformly. And so if you're taking different amounts of money from different hospitals, that's not a uniform tax. Um, literally any other uh, funding source would be eligible for, potentially eligible for Medicaid match, but not if you tax hospitals differently or necessarily do it in this way. Um, and, you know, again, I would just say we've made a lot of progress in the current health care reform efforts that we're doing. And I think hospitals would really appreciate um, the support of their public partners in going through this effort. Um, even if, you know, you took five dollars from the hospital budgeting process, it would send a message of, okay, we set up this regulatory for hospital uh, hospitals to be under, we set up this um, health care reform effort that we want you to do, but now we're going to come in a couple years down the road and change things a little bit and be unpredictable. And I think it would really demoralize hospitals when they are um, really stepping up at this time to try to implement health care reform. I'm counting on our hospital system to be more resilient and not so sort of demoralized by <laughs> such, such an event. But, uh, and I think we can count on that. And I look forward to it. But uh, I, I hear your concern expressed to the committee. Any questions? Yes, yeah, so um, something you said, you know, kind of got me thinking. Um, so if we were to assume, and I'm <coughs> presumptively, uh, if we were to assume that the evidence is that one of the best return on investment um, in terms of uh, primary care leading to savings and access being um, a fundamental piece of access, which, for as you pointed out, might be a, a subset of folks who um, have very high co-pays through the coverage they have, or uninsured, but, but getting affordable access to primary care for those folks, you were saying, as opposed to a big system. Um, so what if, for example, we said, OK, you invested $14 million in primary care last year. Um, Maybe that 14 million should be going directly to subsidizing co-pays for the people who cannot currently access primary care, <coughs> rather than the investments that uh, are targeted under the way the ACO model is functioning. What if it was a, a redirection? Is that a potential way of getting at the same thing that we're all trying to get at? Um, well, then. Because the fourteen million didn't work, or I mean, would you want to do that when no, it showed? If the hypothesis is that would be that would work better at achieving mm -hmm. the goal, mm -hmm. that it might be a better investment. If we say, well, we, we, we right now we can't come up with other money. We don't want to take more money from the hospitals uh, to do other stuff. But what if we took the same money that's being invested, but said, but well, this might be a better investment in terms of. Um, you know, cost containment because getting these folks who aren't getting access to primary care into primary care would be the best short term specific way of, you know, of cost containment. Yeah, I mean, I think that would create a tension between the primary care providers and the patients. Um, and I would certainly leave that up to Todd Moore to answer that question. Um, but yeah, I guess I would I would worry about that tension. But just thinking out of the box. Sorry. Just Back in your box. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh. And I just want to be I I need to respond to what you said, Representative Lippert, about hospitals and and the demoralization. I'm I'm not saying they couldn't afford a five dollar thing i'm just saying that the message it sends is you know this is all a voluntary thing that sort of works against their best interests so sending a message of we don't necessarily you know, well, it would just be support would be appreciated. i appreciate what the hospital system what the hospitals of vermont are doing and participating in this i don't mean to suggest anything otherwise 
Um, it just seems a little, uh, I'll just dial back my comment. I, mean, I just think that, that the hospitals would be so easily demoralized was more than I would uh, anticipate. So, but I appreciate the possibility. But I think we should, uh, that's not the, so the, let's stop there for, I mean, we've heard earlier a lot of testimony this morning and uh, appreciate your participating uh, and others. And the committee is, as everyone knows, has a short time frame to make a series of important decisions and we have other bills that we're going to turn to later this afternoon and tomorrow, but we will just so people know, this is this will be the part of our significant focus as we go into next week, which will probably be um, very close to the end of what we're going to be able to do as a committee. So, thank you. Thank you, Doug.